Okay. Welcome to the third BTR Bridging Transportation Researchers Conference. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. So today, this session is for track 3E, and my name is uh, Dr. Dia Smith from the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia. I'll be moderating the first half of this session. So from 12 to 2, and Professor Jonathan Cochran will be uh, moderating the second half of this uh, session 3E, which will be from 2 to 4. So let's go ahead and start with this session. So for today's session, for the first half, 12 to 2, can everyone see my screen as well? Yes, okay. very clear. Thank you. Yes. So for the first half of session three, our topic of research is public transport and travel behavior. And we have four different papers that will be presented in this order. I have a few of these presentations with me. So if they are not available to you or your connection is not that stable, I can play it from here. Otherwise, if your connection is stable, you're most welcome to have a live presentation as well. So uh, before we go ahead and start with the presentations, a few details about the time limits. So you have 20 minutes to present. I'll remind you three minutes and then one minute before your time is up, such that you have enough time to wrap it up. And there'll be a 10 minute at the end of each presentation for Q&A. Uh, if anybody has questions while the presentation is on, you can type your question in the chat box and uh, we can take those questions up later on once the session ends. If you want to ask them yourselves, just raise your hand or just type in that you have a question you want to ask and we can uh, go ahead and you can ask it yourself instead of typing it. If it's a complex question and you don't want to type it in the chat box, you can ask it directly to the presenter. Everyone clear on the times? Okay, so let's go ahead and start with the presentation. I just need to make sure that I am recording it. Yeah, it's being recorded. So let's start with the first presentation. The first presentation, a brief bio about the presenter. So the topic for the first presentation is the effectiveness of using Google Maps location history data to detect joint activities in social networks. The presenter, we have a few different authors. The presenter today is Jan Carlos, and he's trained as an architect and an urban planner with expertise on urban transportation planning. He was a visiting lecturer at ETH Zurich in 2019 and is now a lecturer at the Department of Urban Engineering at the University of Tokyo. He's conducting research on the relation between built environments, social networks, and travel behavior. So I'll go ahead and make sure that I am allowing you to share your screen. Jan Carlos, can you just double check that you are able to share your screen? Because I think you're sharing your screen, so I cannot do it. Yeah, I've stopped mine, so yeah. Okay, there it should be. Okay, then. Can you see the screen? Can you see the screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jan Carlos Parade from the University of Tokyo, and today I would like to present a research on the effectiveness of. Um, wait, let me just turn. Can you see the, the which screen? Can you see? Can you see the full screen or the presenter screen? Um, I think we we can see the. Writing to write at the bottom. Yeah, we can't see the full screen now. No, okay, that was like, I don't know, now he's detecting voice for some reason. But anyway, so the presentation title is the effectiveness of using Google Maps location history data to detect joint activities in social networks. And I know um, Kara said yesterday that these are the Transportation Olympics and we're actually competing with the real Olympics. So I'll try to be brief. Uh, so some context, I think uh, we can all agree that using this kind of Google, Google location um, history data because of its classic nature, it's appealing to researchers on human mobility and transportation 
uh, because we can reduce the burden that uh, traditional direct um, active uh, service have. And we're not the first one, the first ones to, to have done uh, um, to have done this kind of research. But in the in the past, uh, some studies have compared like uh, Google location history data against GPS data, and they found an 85% agreement when you aggregate the data spatially to 100 meters mesh. Uh, some of the studies also evaluated the performance of uh, this kind of data against uh, by connecting the mobile to different networks, like a 2G, 3G, and Wi-Fi networks as well as uh, using only the GPS systems. And they compared against a better, a higher accuracy GPS, and they found that GPS yielded the best performance followed by 3G, 2G, and finally with Wi-Fi having the worst performance. Uh, then Cooled uh, recently this year conducted a different study where they actually compared not against GPS data, but directly against ground truth data by having a synthetic schedule. And uh, they found that the, over, the overall detection rate was 51%, right? And they also found that iPhones underperformed against Androids uh, 28% versus 57%. The other part of the context is like, we know that uh, social interactions and social activities account for a significant share of trips and are one of the fastest growing segments of travel. In the particular case of Japan, which is our context, uh, 40 to 60% of all out-of-home activities are actually joint trips. Uh, so they're collecting activity data on joint activities remains a difficult task because we're targeting the group, not the individual. So that increases uh, considerably the response burden. We also have the issue that high spatial temporal variability of social activities, in particular leisure, uh, requires longer periods of observation to be able to gather um, uh, higher quality data. So briefly said, the research objective of this uh, project is to evaluate the potential of using uh, Google location history data to identify joint activities in networks. Um, to do that, we conducted an experiment. We were following the, the, the cool et al approach and that we conducted, uh, but we added the joint activity component. So we recruited students from three universities in Japan. Uh, one is, uh, two of them were in the central area in Tokyo and one of them was in Hiroshima. And uh, we, basically conducted uh, synthetic schedules uh, by part, groups of four. So we designed, we designed the schedules uh, on average eight hours long, and then we asked, we asked them to uh, conduct the schedules. And then we did that basically on, uh, based on these three um, characteristics. So I don't know if you can see the point there. Uh, so duration, uh, floor area ratio of destination to have a measure of the built environment, and then group size. In addition, we also control for um, device, uh, so Android or iPhone and Wi-Fi settings. So as you can see here in the, in the right side, we gave each which participant five devices. We have a GPS logger that we're not gonna be using in this discussion. And then we gave them two Android phones and two iPhones. And then we randomly assigned uh, the Wi-Fi settings so that we always have one iPhone and one Android uh, on at all times. And then uh, we def then defined several measures of accuracy. Uh, we divided it in terms of spatial accuracy and temporal accuracy. So spatial accuracy, um, S is measured as the Euclidean distance between the true location and the estimated location by the by Google Maps. Uh, you see, and the true location with the centroid of the geo-referenced uh, location data. And uh, we also use an alternative measure that was the Google ID locations, which uh, is in, as you probably know, uh, when you look at Google Maps, every facility that is registered in Google Maps have a Google, a Google ID location. So we can actually match uh, these locations against the ones that the phone actually detected to see, uh, to measure accuracy. And then in terms of temporal accuracy, there are several ways to measure that. Uh, but in this particular case, we're gonna fo we focus on what we call the intersect, which is basically the overlapping between the ground truth, which is a schedule that we planned, and uh, uh, the, the location, the, the information gathered by Google location history data. So that basically has a, um, a range between zero and one, right? So if it's completely overlap, it will be one. And if there's no overlap at all, then it will be zero. So based on those two indicators, then we define what is what we call the activity rate. So we first define an activity A that has information X, A, and J, A. Which, are informa which is information on uh, the characteristics of the data itself, and then the number of um, the members, uh, in the number of individuals uh, that participated in each activity respectively. And then uh, I'm not gonna go uh, into the details here, but when then we define an individual activity detection delta J, that is uh, a function of uh, the, the two spatial accuracy, spatial and temporal accuracy thresholds that we define, right? So 
we, def we can def uh, based on this, we can define any activity detection given specified, a pre specified uh, spatial temporal accuracy threshold. And then we can de uh, define a group activity detection delta A as the product of individual detections. And then we can also obtain the activity detection rate for uh, any G group size activities uh, following this equation here, which is basically the, the average of all the activity, all the uh, detection rates um, for a given group, uh, a G group size with a specific um, special temporal attribute, uh, sorry, accuracy threshold. And then uh, just to briefly talk about the re aggregate results, let me first explain how this table, this figure works. On the vertical axis here, you have uh, the spatial threshold S, so it's basically the distance. And then on the, the horizontal axis, you have the temporal threshold T, right? So the overlap ratio between the, the both uh, ground truth and good location data. So the closer you are to the bottom left here, the more strict uh, the spatial temporal thresholds are. And the closer you are to the bottom to the top, um, right here, then the, the, more, the more relaxed these indicators are. So, and then the left pane of each plot here in the, is basically the Android uh, detection rates, and the right pane corresponds to the iPhone detection rates. So I think the first thing that we can see uh, consistent across all the plots is that there's a clear difference in accuracy between Android and iPhones, which is much more marked than the ones reported by Pulse et al. Uh, they use a different uh, accuracy indicator, so it's not directly compatible, but we can see here that when you use, for example, Google Play's ID match, uh, Androids are, sorry, iPhones are barely detected. Uh, so when you focus only on Android devices, we can see for, for this red box here. So um, the detection rate was 22% for a four size group and then 26% for uh, individual activity. When you relax uh, a little bit uh, the accuracy thresholds, for example, um, 10 meters for spatial threshold and uh, 0 0.72 for temporal threshold, you can see that um, the, the detection rate for a uh, four, for four person activity will be 38%, while the detection rate for an individual activity will be 46%. So we can see that the overall trend is that the larger groups result actually in lower detection rates, but these reductions were actually smaller than we expected. Uh, in addition to that, we also wanted to know okay, so which factors actually affect uh, detection probability. So to do that, we estimated uh, two sets of blended logic models uh, given different spatial temporal accuracy thresholds. So the first set of models is individual devices. So we only focus on all the devices individually. And the second set will be joint activity detection where the, value, the dependent variable will take a value of one if all the members in the group were detected giving thresholds ST and it will take uh, zero otherwise. So um, in terms of the effect sizes, uh, let me explain how these plots work. So first of all, you have one of these boxes where each of the variables that we consider. Uh, red uh, boxes indicate a negative effect, so a negative association with activity detection. And then the blue uh, boxes indicate a positive effect, so a positive association with activity detection. And then the darker the color, uh, the bigger the magnitude of the effect. Uh, the left hand plots are the detections at the individual level, while the right hand plots are the joint detection, given different spatial temporal activity thresholds. And the values in parentheses are the confidence intervals for each of these measures. So the first thing that we can see is like the floor area ratio elasticity um, is, uh, so we can see a negative association between floor area ratio and activity detection. And uh, we can see that the, the, actually the effect becomes larger as um, you make the threshold more strict. So for example, when you use the Google ID location match, 1% increase in the floor area ratio divided by 100, right? So it'll be like a 100, 200, 300. Um, um, will result in a 0.62% uh, reduction in the probability of detection. And a similar, uh, another one that is, uh, as, as we expected, was the activity duration. So we can see that it's positively associated with activity detection. The longer the activity uh, goes on, the, like, the higher the likelihood that we will properly detect it. And you can see here that 1% uh, increase in activity duration will result in a 0.76% increase in uh, detection probability for threshold 10 meters and 0.8 respectively. And, uh, but we also noted that when we match by uh, Google ID, then the, the effect is actually much more smaller. So we can say that, um, uh, the, the, uh, sorry, the Google ID is actually less um, sensitive to, 
to uh, QVT duration. And I can see also here that I just realized that we actually have negative effects on the uh, left hand in the lower um, part of the confidence interval. So you can see that the inference, the inference here is actually not very accurate. Um, in terms of marginal effects for Android devices, uh, this is a very, very large effect as we saw in the, in the previous plot. So uh, the difference would be on average 34 percentage points between an Android device and uh, um, iPhone, which is a very large effect. And then on the other hand, Wi-Fi on, so having your Wi-Fi on, on was actually negligibly, the, the, the effect is very, very negligible in size. You can see that these effects are very small, very close to zero, and uh, the, the confidence intervals are actually very large and include both positive and negative values. Uh, a little bit uh, surprising finding was that the open space marginal effect was actually negatively, it was actually negative. So uh, activities in, in open spaces were actually less likely to be detected than otherwise. And uh, we have, well, we evaluated um, test different uh, interactions and test different models to see uh, whether this actually was the right effect, but uh, the effect is actually very consistent. And uh, we have some uh, hypotheses regarding the nature of that. So as you can probably know, like in, in recent days, like Google location history does not rely that much on, on GPS. So they use GPS, but they also use a lot of other sources of information. Uh, of all the devices that are connected with the next the network that you're connected to, et cetera, et cetera, to pinpoint your location. And we hypothesize that maybe it is possible that in, when you're indoors, there are much more devices that you, Google can take information for, from to actually pinpoint your location as opposed to an uh, open space. Uh, we still need to run some more tests and validate that, but um, that is probably the, our working hypothesis at the moment. When you look at the joint detection, we can see that uh, floor area ratio is consistent. So we can see similar effects uh, as, as seen in the individual case. And for the case of um, activity duration, uh, we can see, the, again, a similar trend. So a 1% increase um, in activity duration will result in a 1.07% increase in detection probability. And you can see here that in the case of um, uh, even this Google location ID, uh, the, the, the effect is actually much more accurately estimated than in the individual case, which makes sense because you have uh, several agents at the same time. So you probably need a little bit more time to actually pinpoint that location. Uh, Android ratio elasticity, uh, again, you have a massive effect here. So 1% um, increase in the ratio of devices that are Androids in the group, results in a 2.2% increase in detection probability. And on the other hand, uh, Wi-Fi is the ratio of devices used with Wi-Fi on, uh, as opposed to the case of uh, individual devices where the effects are not very clear, almost very near to zero, you actually find uh, a relatively, uh, a positive trend in the effect, right? So um, in this particular case, you can see here. Although the effects for the Google ID mass, and there, you can see here negative, negative uh, values in the confidence intervals and values are very close to zero. Um, finally, group size marginal effect, uh, as we expected, is negatively associated with the uh, detection probability. In this particular case of 10 and 0.8, we have uh, for one an additional individual joining the group. We have a reduction of nine percentage points in the detection probability, uh, which is a moderate moderate size effect, uh, not a, not as large as we actually expected. Which might be a good might be, might be good news because that means you probably group size will not have that much effect, uh, or not that will, the effect will not be as large as, as to hamper research, provided that you can actually gather information on, on these individuals. Um, but again, uh, when you saw in the first chart, the aggregate results, we noticed that big difference between Android and, and iPhone. So we decided to uh, run an Android only model. So the same models, but using only Androids. And we can see that for uh, floor area range and activity duration, we can see the same exact trend, right? So um, that effect is very consistent. In the case of open space, uh, the effects actually became larger, but the, 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 the effects are still negative as, as in, the, in the case of all devices combined. And then Wi-Fi on marginal effects, the effects are basically zero. So it's very likely that um, Wi-Fi does not have any effect on detection probability uh, whatsoever. And uh, in terms of uh, focusing on joint detection, again, the flow area ratio and activity duration analysis are very consistent across uh, all the models. Uh, in the particular case of open space, we also see a similar trend, so negative and, and uh, relatively large effects. Uh, the Wi-Fi on ratio elasticity was uh, relatively different compared to the case of um, all devices. So we can see here that the effects are very close to zero. All the confidence intervals include negative values. So 
uh, we cannot make any inference based on that, which is similar to and rather surprising to group size. But we can see here that the effects are actually much more, much smaller and actually includes in the confidence interval both positive and negative values. So um, any inference regarding the uh, uh, large effect uh, regarding group size is probably going to be made in this particular case. And in addition to the magnitude of effects that we just discussed, we also um, uh, calculated the predictive accuracy of the estimated models. Uh, these tables are have way too much information, so I'm not going to go into details, but the way to read them is you have different models here with different uh, spatial and temporal thresholds, and then you have the different um, accuracy indicators here. So the GLA's activity detection rate is actually observed activity detection rate, so this is the, from the data directly. And then from model accuracy down are just um, different acu uh, predictive accuracy measures. Um, there is a clear difference between two, true positive rates and true negative rates across all the models. And this is related basically to the observed ground truth detection rate. So, uh, because uh, the accuracy rates are actually 21%, um, 28% in around that level, there's a bunch of activities that were not actually detected, right? So that affects uh, this result. So, I would, this accuracy measure. So, uh, the, this model accuracy 80%. Balance accuracy 64% might be a little bit misleading uh, or like true negative rate 91%, right? So we are gonna focus on true positive rates, which actually the, the indicators that makes our models look the worst, but they are actually, I think, we, we believe that are the more honest indicators as well. Uh, so for type one models that are in this table, the ones that have the most strict um, spatial temporal um, uh, thresholds, uh, true positive rates are 37% for individual detection all devices, 47% for individual detection Android only, 9% uh, for joint detection all devices, and 15.3% for joint detection Android only. Um, so I think uh, if you, to summarize this, I think we, are, we have actually identified several factors associated with detection and quantified these effect magnitudes. There is certainly a lot of room for improvement uh, in terms of identifying other factors associated with detection, both at the individual and the joint level, particularly at the joint level. Sorry, just a quick reminder, you have like two and a half minutes. Okay, this is the last slide, so. Oh, slide thank left. you. Okay. okay, so discussion and conclusion, well, to some extent we agree with the conclusions reached by previous researchers that current detection rates might limit its usefulness in terms of control behavior studies. We also agree that these detection rates, while they're not ideal, should be weighted against the potential of observing travel behavior over long periods of time. And uh, there are possible ways that we can actually use, uh, we, we're still working around this, but um, how to use this data combined with other data sources. So we can probably, for example, estimate a propensity score of any activity being detected, and we can use the inverse probability weighting to obtain unbiased frequency, frequencies for joint activities for a particular group, and then trying to use that uh, when we try to merge, identify joint activities with that data with other data sources. And then uh, another finding that was a big, large gap in detection rates between the iPhones and Androids, which imposes serious limitation on the usability of this data, given that they have market, the market share for iPhone is actually very large, I think 50, more than 50% in many countries. Uh, this gap could be attributed to the difference in privacy policies between iPhones and Androids. And we believe that in order to collect data at the required quality level, we probably need to identify all the required level of privacy encroachment necessary to obtain the desired accuracy levels and then see if people are actually willing to that, to accept that or not, right? So science communication might be necessary here to help people understand why and how are we using that data. And it might be possible we probably need a privacy policy agreement between public bodies and citizens that is separate from the ones that the OS firms actually make. So I would like to wrap it up here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jan Carlos. That was a very interesting presentation and also very well timed. That's like exactly 20 minutes. So we'll open up the floor for any questions. If anyone has got any questions, please go ahead and unmute yourself. And none in the chat box. You can unmute yourself and ask the question to Jan Carlos directly. Hi, uh, Jan. Hi, oh, Dr. Prati. <laughs> Friend, uh, nice uh, presentation. I think it's really innovative uh, methodology. I uh, just have a, a comment and a small question. And my comment is, I think the four students that were uh, uh, employed to do this um, uh, protocol, 
I wonder what kind of uh, area, the built environment surrounding the, the route. So I think that will help us understand better um, the different effects of the variables you, you, you presented at the end. Um, and uh, I wonder this uh, kind of uh, methodology can also be applied in other uh, high density cities like Hong Kong. Um, um, so because in Japan, I'm not sure uh, the, 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 the fuel area is a high density, low density. So the transferability of the methodology, I think can be better in, uh, uh, discussed. My, my uh, minor question is that I find out the negative um, effect of the open space is a little bit counterintuitive. I thought uh, the open space in would, would uh, improve the uh, um, will have a positive effect. So, so can you uh, briefly uh, uh, explain? That? Thank you. Yes, um, thank you. Nice to see you. It's, it's been a while. Well. Um, uh, regarding the first thing, yes. Uh, for in terms of build environment, we actually try to have diversity in that. So, I think the build environment range from one hundred FAR FAR to more than seven hundred. So, I think the maximum was like uh, we have activities in the central around Tokyo Station. And I think the, the FAR is around there is like 1,200. Um, so but we try to, the, the, that was randomly allocated. So probably have enough um, variation in terms of that. But we also have data from Hiroshima, uh, not Hiroshima city, it's actually around a suburb from Hiroshima. So, so we actually have bar, bar variations in the built environment. And yes, I think this, this can be replicated in, in, in any city. If anything, we would like to see in other cities to see if we can validate our results. And uh, regarding the open space, uh, I don't know if my co-authors want to actually chime in on this, but we, that's the point that we're discussing the most. We are actually very counterintuitive. But we test it, we try to separate the open spaces by size because we have smaller parks and we have like big parks like Yogi Park probably, you know, or like the Imperial Palace, that kind of thing. But we believe that uh, when you're indoors, like let's say you're in a shop, like a tower office, like there's a lot of devices that Google can take information from. So they don't rely in GPS so much as in the past. So they use uh, data which if there is uh, any 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 other uh, uh, information emitting device, they might use that as well. Uh, they, they, we don't know for sure because we don't really know how exactly they do it. But uh, looking at the Google um, platform specification, where they say that we don't we rely on other data as well, not only the GPS, uh, gave us gave us an idea. Um, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, not really. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, from me, no. So I, I totally agree to Jiang-san. OK, so any more questions? If there are no more questions, then we'll move on to the next presentation. Let me bring up my slides. So I will share the screen again just to give a brief bio for the next presenter. So we have the next presenter. So our next presentation is titled Using Data Mining to Explore the Spatial and Temporal Dynamics of Perceptions of Metro Services in Shenzhen. So the presenter is Shuli Luo, is currently a final year PhD student in the Department of Geography and Resource Management, the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Her research interests include GIS, transport geography, urban analytics, spatial big data, and social inequality. So I'll hand it over to her. Yeah, let me share my screen. And so can we, I'm sorry. So can you see my whole screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, good morning and good afternoon. I, I'm Shuli Luo from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. I'm um, today, it's been an honor to have this opportunity to share my recent research work uh, collaborating with my supervisor, Sylvia. Uh, which is about uh, how we could utilize in social media mining to explore the spatial and temporal dynamics of the perceptions of metro services in Shenzhen. And then uh, from today's presentation, I will go to present in 
four folds. Uh, firstly, I will give a brief introduction of the key concepts and the measurement of this study, and then present my methodology and followed by the results and some discussion. Uh, firstly, uh, I want to clarify the key concepts of the service quality, which we focused on. Uh, as is quite a common uh, research direction for the service evaluation, but it's quite complex and abstract for the service quality for its properties of uh, intangibility, which means that we couldn't measure the service quality uh, as a function of physical characteristics and the heterogeneity, which we explain that we will evaluate the service quality uh, from person to person and from day to day. And then it's about the characteristic of its inseparability, which means that we couldn't uh, separate the evaluation of the service quality from the uh, production and the consumption process. And then from the literature, uh, I will show a definition of the service quality here based on the disconfirmation theory that defines the service quality as a, a gap between the expectations and the perceptions of the actual service received. And uh, from here, um, my motivation of this research actually is originated from the perception gap between the uh, transport stakeholders and our consumers' perspective. So here I just illustrate uh, a screenshot from the Hong Kong MTR, the Metro System um, uh, website. So from uh, every year, they will release annual report uh, to indicate how well their performance is. As we all know that Hong Kong is being well known for its the uh, service performance. And from those uh, page, we could see they have illustrated a lot of indicators. And from this page, we could see all the numbers are actually nearly perfect, right? And all about 100%. So from this screenshot, we could sim sim similarly uh, obtain this message from the stakeholder that the performance has done a nearly perfect job. And there is no need for improvement from their perspective. Uh, however, uh, from the customer's perspective, I just simply, um, from the Google, I just simply type the word keyword of Hong Kong MTR and unsatisfied. And it pumps up in total of 800,000 results. So um, we could see here from, uh, we could see a distinct perception gap about the metro services performance from the stakeholders' perspective. As, and our customers' perspective. So here, um, I quote a citation here, which I'm totally agreeing with, uh, that is that the consumers are the only judges of the service quality, and which also highlights importance to study the service quality of the uh, public transport system from our consumers' perspective. And then uh, from the literature, there are a lot of discussion that highlights uh, why we need to study the service quality from our consumers' rights uh, and as it investigate how much the uh, impact of the service quality in connection with the consumer's sat satisfaction with the whole transport system and thereafter for their behavior intention. For example, in our case study, they may repurchase or recommend the metro services to others and as for the uh, service quality measurement, um, for the traditional measurements, typically we will collect the customer satisfaction survey, which here I will also, I have also illustrated a short example of how the satisfaction survey looks like. We will ask uh, a lot of questions related to the service quality performance and ask how well uh, it performs or whether the customers are satisfied or not. And then much varied of uh, data analysis will be applied to extract what's the most important service characteristics in our uh, public perceptions and which also help the stakeholders to uh, improve their performance in accordance with the public perceptions. And, but however, there are some certain limitations of those tradition, traditional measurements. Firstly, of course, it's quite costly and time consuming. 
and may cause some uh, inaccuracy due to the memory distortion problems. And secondly, most importantly, I we argue that the perception of the trans transport service quality actually is largely dependent on the spatial context and the temporal skills on which the traditional measurement failed to capture those dynamics. And instead, we argue that the social media um, uh, has significantly transformed the way in which the travel information is, is emanated and exchanged. And uh, it's quite a common case in our daily life. We would post our daily travel experience on those uh, social media platform, which we regard as quite a suitable uh, data uh, tool to uh, mind uh, our public perceptions of the transport systems. So here, the research objectives of this research. Firstly, uh, as a relatively new field of the social media mining transportation, job, uh, transportation field, we want to identify those key perceived service quality attributes which have or haven't been investigated in current literature. And secondly, uh, we want to um, measure and depict the spatial and temporal dynamics of those key service quality attributes in the case of China. So, um, and so here I will briefly introduce the uh, research background of the uh, study context. So the study context we choose is the Shenzhen, China, uh, which bordering the Hong Kong to the south and the Guangdong uh, to the north. Uh, the metro system in Shenzhen, we have in total of eight lines with line one, the green line and the line four being opened in 2004. And there is another interesting I want to post here is that the line for the red line actually is uh, um, operated by the MTR Hong Kong, but the other seven lines are operated by the Shenzhen Metro Group. And for the data collection process, we simply use a web scrapping tools with the, uh, based on the uh, two of the Weibo advanced searching function. And this function and the industry here, we uh, it helps us to uh, clarify the keyword and also constrain our uh, um, data collection uh, within the original macro blocks, which has excluded those retweets and those authority accounts. Also, it helps us to specify the area which we are interested in, and also some uh, user ID and text will also be retrieved from this data collection process. And then uh, we have collected data, uh, uh, half year data in 2018. And uh, after data processing, about uh, 41,000 uh, micro blocks were retrieved. And this is a, a methodology framework of this study. After we have get collected of those data website, and we will divide it into three dimensions to study this topic. Um, firstly, from the semantic front, we will conduct the uh, semi-automatic content analysis as we are interested about those key service quality attributes uh, from those unstructured Weibo dataset. And then we will visualize the temporal dynamics of those perceptions of uh, service quality attribute in different temporal scales and also visualize the special footprint of those identified web data set um, to see the hotspot of the uh, public concerns. And firstly, I will uh, introduce the result of the content analysis. So here is a table of the identified service quality attribute. And we have identified in total of uh, about uh, 10 uh, categories of service quality attributes such as reliability, frequency. And here we derive this table based on some literature and as well as our practical understanding of our Weibo dataset, and then identify a lot of uh, subcategories uh, in uh, under this uh, category, and also simply count the frequency of those keywords of service quality attribute and uh, calculating the uh, sentiment uh, uh, of uh, sen uh, we conduct a sentiment analysis in our Weibo dataset to see 
our uh, whether our uh, customers are expressing positive or negative feelings towards a certain service quality attribute. And here, as the first objective of this study is to study whether there are some certain accordance or a coincidence or some specific characteristics in uh, social media mining. Uh, here, uh, firstly, we have found some coincidence service attributes found in which we which also found quite important in literature, such as the reliability, safety, personnel behavior, and which condition in literature they are also play uh, an important role in affecting public uh, perceptions of the metro system in literature. But and more interestingly, we have also. Uh, identified some context-specific characteristics in Chinese context. Uh, firstly, uh, it's about the crowdedness. As in literature, the most important service quality attribute actually is about um, is the reliability and the punctuality in literature. However, in our context, the dominant concern uh, in our Chinese context actually is the crowdedness. And from here, we can see about 10% of the uh, whole data set uh, is about uh, the concerns over the crowdedness issue uh, during the travel. And then it's about uh, the security check. And I believe which is quite unique in Chinese context that uh, in Chinese metro, we need also to Uh, let your belongings be scanned by to the uh, security check process in the airport. And the third one is the ticket uh, services. And uh, this ticket services, uh, which is mainly about the e-payment service, which means that you need to scan uh, the uh, QR code when you enter the metro gate. And then uh, from the sentiment analysis result, um, in accordance with the most uh, uh, empirical studies, actually people are expressing more negative feelings compared to the positive feelings online. But more interestingly, in addition to those various negative sentiments, we have found some certain uh, service quality attributes receive more favorable feedbacks, such as in our case, such as the fair cleanliness and uh, the availability. And when zooming to the temporal dynamics, we have visualized the uh, uh, temporal dynamics of our web data set in, diff in different temporal scales. So here from the, this figure, we plot the uh, temporal dynamics by day. We could identify two uh, clear peaks where um, when uh, there are two line disruptions and also a clear valley uh, occurred on September 16th in 2018. On that day, there is a typhoon. So on that day, all the metro system has been uh, has closed their services on that day so that they are, are quite rare. Uh, Microblogs are mentioned about these uh, metro services. And when zooming to a more detailed window by the day of week from Sunday to Saturday, and also from the hour of the week, hour of the day, we could uh, identify uh, several different temporal patterns. So firstly, uh, from the service quality attribute, we identified uh, the first four are crowdedness, waiting condition, reliability, and uh, frequency. So here we could identify a very clear intraweek variation with a singular uh, morning peak hour with dominantly uh, negative feelings expressed on, on those morning peak hours. And we explain that it's quite reasonable because uh, during the morning peak hour, uh, the commuting trips uh, are, are mainly the commuting trips so that people are more concerned with the uh, crowdedness level, the reliability and the frequency of the metro systems. And then in contrast to this first four uh, service attributes, we have also identified a very different temporal patterns of the following three uh, temporal patterns. We could find, uh, in addition to this sing single peak hour, we have found a, a more balanced uh, temporal distribution regarding the services of the supporting facilities, 
comfort on the personal behavior. And we explain it may due to the uh, customer's uh, travel habit, which means that uh, only when you are utilizing those supporting facilities or encountering some uh, problems so that you ask help from the personnel, then you will express uh, the uh, the feelings about those uh, service quality you encountered so that it will show less regularity of, of regarding the temporal skills. And the finally is that we could identify all, uh, different temporal uh, patterns regarding the service of the safety concerns. Uh, in particular, we could identify there are a large amount of discussion around the safety concerns during the weekend, especially during the weekend night, which we explain is that due to the routine activities such as those entertainment or visiting friends at the weekend night. And uh, also from the special temporal, uh, special dynamics, we have plot the footprint uh, embedded in our web data set and uh, apply the kernel density function to visualize those hotspots of the public uh, concerns. So here um, we have identified in total of five clusters where people uh, posted their uh, public concerns about those perceived service quality attributes. The first three, one, uh, two, three are uh, concentrated around those CBD areas and the following two are uh, railway stations. So in this regard, we argue that the land use function around the station and the main function of the station itself, such as the railway station and commuter hub, still contributes to the cognitive process that people assess uh, the service quality of the metro system. And in addition to those five clusters we identified here, we have also have found some uh, interesting questions, uh, interesting uh, findings regarding the personnel behavior. The special pattern uh, of the uh, public perceptions of the perception uh, personnel behavior is quite different. As here we have identified a very clear line shaped cluster along the line four. As we have mentioned before in the introduction page, the line four actually is operated by the MTR Hong Kong. And uh, from those uh, related uh, Weibo data set, uh, most of them are expressing a more uh, positive feelings uh, about the personnel behavior uh, operated by the line four, which may warrant uh, the other seven lines operators, the Shenzhen Metro Corporation, to dig out whether there are there is a significant difference between the special patterns. And uh, the finally is the, the special uh, pattern of the service quality of the safety issues. We could identify a very clear uh, new clusters residing in the remote areas, which uh, at the end of the uh, line four and also uh, some remote areas in Shenzhen, and which is we regard is quite reasonable that people will uh, concern uh, more about the safety issues at those remote remote areas and especially during night. So just here quick, I will just oh, okay. It's conclusion. You have one. Yeah, I, have, I will. I will quickly conclude. Yeah, no Thank problem. Thank you. And um, as for as for the conclusion, and uh, in response to our research questions and research objectives, we have identified uh, constant consistent service quality attribute such as reliability and waiting condition, which also found quite important in public perceptions in China. While more importantly, we have uh, identified some context specific attributes such as security check and some new emerging payment technology services. And secondly, we have identified substantial variations in regarding the temporal and spatial dyna dynamics of the perceived services, service quality attribute. And finally, we have found the effect of the commuting trip, the urban settings, and the built environment, and the service brands on the perceived uh, service quality are quite significant in this study. And finally, is our uh, contribution policy implication. 
on this study extends previous study mining transfer related information from social media in Asian contexts and especially in China. On the methodology framework, we regard this quite especially helpful for city where hasn't any prior knowledge about those context specific service quality attribute as we have introduced as that in previous, if you haven't any prior knowledge, you must rely on those literature to investigate those service quality attributes in other contexts. And finally, we regard this study is quite uh, useful for transport uh, stakeholders and policymakers to make more informed decisions and allocate the investment and resources to improve their service performance. And finally, uh, I will introduce uh, recently this uh, research work is uh, just recently been published in the uh, environment planning B and I'm very welcome if you have any questions and feedbacks and comments. And then actually uh, based on the same data set and also uh, as a part of my PhD thesis, the second study of my, uh, st uh, the second case study of my thesis is to understand the gender dimension of the perceptions of the service quality attributes based on the same data website and the Weibo data set. If you are interested, I'm very happy to discuss you with more in the later stage. And thank you and I finish my presentation. Thank you very much for the great presentation, Shirley. Uh, we'll open yeah. the floor to questions, if there are any questions from anyone. No questions? Um, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you for yeah. your presentation. I was curious, did you compare your results against like official uh, transit satisfaction surveys to see if there were differences and, and similarities? Uh, you mean this table? This is from, from your results, right? Uh, yeah. But are there like are there like the transit uh, agencies themselves? Sometimes they conduct uh, satisfaction service, right? Oh uh, yeah, you mean so, this table? I just capture a screen from the other uh, customer satisfaction survey. Okay, okay. So can you could be, so if you compare your results from uh, from big data, right, against uh, this result from this um, traditional. Uh, sorry, what are your similarities or differences? I'm sorry, I I I I seem lost my connection. So um, could you please repeat it again? Sorry for, for the um, can I write in the chat maybe? Uh-huh. Um I was wondering if there is there were similarities uh between or differences between your study and then uh Service satis customer satisfaction surveys conducted by the transit agencies themselves. Oh, you mean I need to compare about my, uh, sorry, I need to compare about my result with the customer satisfaction conducted by satisfaction survey. But the question is that in the Shenzhen China context, we couldn't get access to those data. And okay. in China's context, they will just announce, I have conducted the customer satisfaction survey, and then what's those important, um, what are those important service quality attributes we found? And uh, actually, I found this quite in uh, also uh, interesting that actually in their report, they have released that the most important uh, service quality attribute in their result actually is about the toilet. Then which means that a lot of um, customers are complaining about the cleanliness and the toilet, the lack of toilet when they take the transit. So which is also we found is quite uh, uh, not is uh, about a, a little bit different from our result discussion. And we explain that maybe in our uh, traditional measurement, uh, it fails to capture the uh, voluntary uh, the perception of 
I expressed a volu voluntary user generated content expressed by our customers as they are asked to uh, rate their satisfaction rates based on like those predefined service quality attributes so that they couldn't express that such as, oh, in addition to those uh, predefined service quality attributes, I am more concerned with those uh, service quality attributes such as the crowdness in our case and or some security check issues in our case study. And uh, also, thank you for your questions. Uh, it's a very good direction that we need to compare why there is a distinct difference between our social media mining results with those customer satisfaction survey conducted by the uh, travel agencies. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Shui. Yeah. So if there are no more questions, then we'll move on to the next presentation. Okay, so I need to share my screen again. And our next presentation is uh, our next presentation is titled Tourist Travel Mode and Length of Stay, Application of a Fully Nested Archimedean Popular Structure. The presenter, presenter is Xin Ming Li. She, uh, Xin Ming is a PhD student in the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of New South Wales. In Sydney and working on the understanding of tourist behaviors based on transport modeling. He received his bachelor's degree from Sun Yat-sen University and master's from Imperial College London. His major research interests include transport modeling and tourist behaviors. So I'll hand it over to Xin Ming. Um, hello, everyone. Um, can everyone see my slide now? Yes, we can. Okay, okay I'm going to start my presentation now. Okay, um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Xin Ming, and I'm from the School of Civil Engineering, uh, of, uh, School of Civil and Environmental Engineering in the UNSW. My supervisors are Taha Reshti and Taiku. Um, Today, my presentation topic would be uh, tourist travel mode and length of stay, um, application of a fully nested Archimedean cobbler structure. <clears throat> um, my presentation will be unfolded from the five parts below. Um, first is introduction, um, second is literature review, and uh, followed by methodology, preliminary results, and finally, uh, the policy implications. First, I'm going to introduce some basic background during uh, uh, a basic background for the uh, the Australian domestic tourism uh, during the COVID-19 and in the post COVID-19 uh, background. <clears throat> during the COVID-19 um, in June quarter last year, um, the overnight trips were down 67% uh, and the overnight spend was down 80%. And within uh, the September quarter in last year, um, the overnight trips was down 42% and the overnight spend was down 50, 53%. <clears throat> What's more, the overnight trips involving air travel accounted for only 6 to 7% in both June and September quarter. While in the uh, post COVID 19 uh, period, the, uh, the Australian domestic tourism industry has started to recover to its original state gradually. Um, for example, um, in December quarter last year, the overnight trips were down uh, only 38% and the overnight spend was down uh, only 43%. <clears throat> um, what is uh, worthwhile to, to mention is that on March 11 this year, uh, an airfare subsidy was offered to 13 destinations in Australia by the Australian federal government. So, um, this study uh, seeks to uh, seeks to look into the tourist behaviors uh, in uh, in Australia and would uh, yeah, sorry and would enlighten some uh, policy making and market, uh, and marketing strategy to the uh, decision makers <clears throat> uh, during the tourism recovery period. Then, um, in my last 
uh, in, in my last topic, I mainly look into the correlation between uh, the time of year and to travel and the trip duration. And in that study, um, the mode choice was regarded as an exogenous mode choice. Then in this study, the mode choice uh, would be endogenized to, uh, to see how these three uh, decisions would be uh, correlated and how they would be uh, interacted with each other. Then um, here are some brief literature review. Um, these, are, uh, these are some literature reviews uh, within the area of multiple tourism uh, decision modeling. And the marked one, uh, uh, the marked one enlightened me the most in the methodology used in this uh, methodology. Then let's in uh, let's step into the methodology part of this uh, study. Um, in this slide, you can see the data source and cleaning process. The data used in this empirical study was collected by the National Visitor Survey conducted by Tourism Research Australia in both 2017 and 2018. The original data set contains 80,920 records of data. Then, um, in order to eliminate some uh, complexity of the data, we concentrated on only Sydney-based single destination trips. Then, uh, we uh, eliminated some data with invalid information, such as on no household income and on no employment uh, status. Ultimately, the data set uh, contains 7,475 records of data. Then on this slide, you can see uh, some simple data descriptions. Uh, <clears throat> um, the, uh, this table indicates that um, or uh, the length of stay, uh, the, uh, the length of stay uh, are, the, are the longest in summer, and the length of stay uh, by uh, the length of stay of air trips are uh, longer than those of uh, car trips. Then uh, on this slide, you can see the model specification. Um, as can be seen in figure one, this is the proposed fully nested Archimedean copula in this study. Um, in such a structure, uh, uh, travel or not travel in a, certain, in a certain season is set as the upper level in, uh, in, in such a structure. And uh, the other two decisions, uh, travel, mo travel mode and length of stay uh, is, uh, are nested under the uh, travel season. And there, there are uh, some, uh, some correlations between the error components of these three, uh, uh, of these three models. Then um, in this study, another corpus structure is also designed to, uh, for the purpose of comparison and selection. Uh, in this alternative uh, structure, um, travel or uh, sorry, the the mode choice is set as uh, set as the upper level, and the other two uh, travel decisions, uh, season and length of stay, are nested on the uh, the mode choice. Also, there would be some correlations between the error components. Then, um, from this slide on, uh, I'm gonna introduce the uh, individual model spe uh, specification. Uh, applied to simulate each uh, travel decision. Um, the first one is um, travel or not travel in a certain season. Um, to simulate this decision, a, lo a logistic regression model is applied. <clears throat> and in this model, a latent variable y is defined. Um, if y is uh, greater than zero, that it means uh, a, a household or a tourist was select to travel in a certain season. And X are, the, are those explanatory variables. And alpha and beta are the parameters uh, we need to estimate. Uh, and eta 
are uh, either is the com error component which uh, conforms to the standard logistic regression model, uh, standard logistic distribution. Uh, then the second uh, second model applied to simulate tourist selection in the uh, transportation mode is the multinomial uh, log uh, logic model, uh, which is based on the uh, utility maximize, uh, utility maximization theorem. Um, it indicates that only uh, the alternative with the highest utility will be selected by a tourist or a household. And uh, what should be noted is that uh, the error component of this model uh, uh, conforms to a uh, gumball distribution. Oh, sorry. Yeah, and um, the third model is uh, applied to applied to simulate tourist selection in uh, uh, lens of stay, <clears throat> uh, which is uh, which is the uh, accelerated failure time model. And in this model, we assume that the error component. Uh, sorry, <clears throat> um, we assume that the error component of this model. Uh, conforms to uh, a log normal distribution. Then in order to combine these three models together, um, we apply uh, a fully nested Archimedean copula structure. Uh, in such a structure, um, there are two uh, dependence parameters, the noted theta one and theta two. Um, in this model, um, theta one, uh, theta two is capturing the correlation between travel mode and length of stay, and theta one is capturing the uh, correlation between travel season and the other two uh, decisions together. And it is required that theta two is greater than theta one. And there are three uh, frequently used copula structures. Um, this first one is Clayton family copula function. In Clayton family, it is required that theta is greater than zero. When theta is close to zero, it indicates independence. Um, uh, and the Clayton family can accommodate strong left tail dependence, but weak right tail dependence. Hence, the Clayton family uh, is suitable for those uh, variables uh, which are likely to experience lower values. And the second uh, family is the Gumbel family copula function. In Gumbel family, it is, right, it is required that theta is greater than or equals to zero, uh, equals to one. When theta is equal to one, it indicates independence. Gumbel family can accommodate strong right tail dependence, but weak left tail dependence. Hence, the Gumbel family um, is suitable for those variables uh, uh, which are likely to experience uh, higher values. And the third one is the uh, Frank family. In uh, Frank family can allow for both positive and negative dependence. When theta is, uh, equal, to, is equal to zero, it ind indicates independence. Um, the Frank family is very weak in accommodating tail dependence. And these three uh, functions are the um, uh, and these three functions are the function uh, are the equation for uh, different kinds of uh, copula functions. Then, uh, based on the uh, uh, based on the work before, we can easily write our joint likelihood function and then the subsequent joint like a uh, log likelihood function. In both equations, we have uh, we have some indicator variables uh, d, uh, which would take take one if individual n travels in a certain season, and the marked term uh, indicates uh, the first derivative of the FNAC at the logarithm transformation of the length of stay. <clears throat> uh, Afterwards, a non-linear a, a non optimization problem can be uh, constructed, which is 
to uh, maximize the log likelihood function and, and subject to two major constraints. The first one is that all the variance terms are required to uh, greater than zero. And the second one is the constraint on the dependence parameter. And the constraint on dependence parameter depends on, uh, uh, depends on the uh, popular functions adopted. Then um, I'm gonna uh, introduce some preliminary results of this study. On this slide, you can see the AIC and BIC uh, uh, values for uh, different structures and different uh, copular structures, and which is uh, and this is uh, aiming for uh, selecting the uh, best fit model in this study. As can be seen from both tables, um, the uh, all the AIC and BIC values are. Um, are smaller in structure one, and in structure one, the Frank type copula function uh, performs the best in uh, fitting the uh, data set. Then um, we also uh, conducted another comparison between the model with uh, Frank type copulas and without copulas. And the result indicates that in uh, the adoption of frank uh, type copulas improved the model goodness of fit. And then on this slide, um, we present the calculation results for the correlation parameters. Um, since the values for the dependence parameter theta uh, uh, can be in, can be infinity, hence uh, uh, it is some it is somehow hard to interpret that uh, dependence parameter directly. Then I uh, translate the dependence parameter theta into uh, two other correlation parameters, Kendall's tau and Spearman's rho, which are ranging from minus one to one, uh, making them easily easier to be interpreted. And uh, the result indicates that all these correlations do not vary considerably across four seasons. Uh, in other words, uh, once a certain trip is determined uh, in a certain season, I'm sorry, um, tourist de decisions on travel mode and length of stay are less likely to be influenced by whichever season selected. And then um, on this slide, you can see uh, the model accuracy uh, from both disaggregate level and aggregate level. Uh, in the first table, um, the, uh, the results are uh, presented from the disaggregate level. Um, the result indicates that um, in predicting car trips, uh, the model achieved a correct rate high uh, up to uh, around 92% and followed by uh, predicting air trips. Uh, which is around 87, 87%. And in the second table, you can see, um, uh, you can see the, uh, uh, the model achieve, um, uh, achieve, at, uh, achieve the uh, accuracy, at the highest accuracy in predicting air, uh, air, tra air trips uh, with the error rate uh, is with er error rate around just uh, 3%, followed by the error rate in predicting car trips uh, around 5%. Um, what is also uh, should be mentioned in both table is that uh, the model achieved quite low accuracy in predicting others' transportation mode, um, which is due to uh, the, general, the general, selection, uh, uh, general selection of uh, explanatory variable. In the model cannot um, cannot capture uh, cannot capture all the characteristics of uh, those transportations uh, transportation modes included in others like uh, water transportation um, and uh, the railways etc. <clears throat> and then on this slide. Um, uh, 
the probability density function for uh, for the lens of state for uh, for the lens of state of each transportation mode uh, is uh, presented. Um, as can be seen from uh, these three figures, um, the predicted lens of state fits the actual lens of state uh, for each transportation mode um, quite well. Also, uh, we uh, present the R squared and the adjusted R squared, which are both around uh, 0 0.77, uh, which is at, uh, at an acceptable level. Finally. Just, sorry, just to interrupt you, I mean, you have around two minutes, okay? Okay, I see. Thank you. Uh, okay, so um, uh, let's step into the final part of this study, uh, the policy implications. Um, in this part, uh, I'm gonna introduce uh, some elasticity of the policy-oriented variables and uh, con con construct a simulated COVID-19 pandemic um, based on those four uh, policy-oriented variables. And these are uh, the uh, elasticity of those policy-oriented variables uh, individually. And then um, um, this is the uh, uh, elasticity for the simulated COVID-19 pandemic. Um, uh, then, uh, uh, as, uh, uh, in this simulated COVID-19 pandemic, um, there are some uh, restrictions on the uh, tri uh, trip destination, uh, 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 trip uh, restriction on travel, uh, trip destinations and um, trip purposes, etc. And the most important one is the travel distance. Um, we decided our uh, restrictions on the travel distance at 45%, uh, which is based on the data set. The average of the average di travel distances of the uh, of the trips within NSW uh, are more or less 45%. Uh, less than the travel, the average travel distances throughout the Australia, and um, the simulated results indicates that um, um, our simulated uh, COVID nineteen pandemic uh, for uh, correspond to the results in uh, cor cor corresponds to the results released by the. Uh, Tourism Research Australia on their website uh, quite well, especially in the June quarter. And finally, um, what we want to uh, mention is that on uh, 11th March this year, um, the federal government uh, offered an airfare subsidy to 13 destinations and four destinations are within uh, Queensland and only one is located in uh, Victoria. Then um, this study is, su uh, is suitable for uh, evaluating that uh, policy from three dimensions. Uh, the result, in, uh, uh, sorry, uh, we uh, designed uh, two scenarios. Uh, scenario one is that uh, we assume all trips are bound for Queensland, and scenario two, we assume all trips are bound for uh, Victoria. And the re uh, simulation result indicates that um, the air usage in scenario one is just a, a slightly uh, uh, higher than scenario two, and the length of stay uh, in scenario one is significantly higher than uh, scenario two. Also, from, uh, from the uh, travel season, um, it indicates that traveling to Queensland bring more utility to tourists than uh, traveling to uh, Victoria in autumn, uh, according to the joint model. And thank you for listening. Uh, if you have any uh, questions, feel free to raise. Yes, thank you, Xinming. That was a great presentation. So if anyone has any questions, please do ask. Uh, hi, hi, hi. I have. Uh, uh, thank you for your nice presentation. I just have one small.
question about, uh, I'm curious about the COVID-19, uh, yeah. And in this figure that actually, uh, I'm curious about that you know, when you uh, explain the error rate, actually uh, the most significant difference Okay, I think we've lost. So could you explain a little bit more? And another question is that, um, and did, uh, may, if I miss some details, that when you simulated the uh, COVID-19 scenarios, whether you have included some additional factors or just based on your built-in model, based on those normal situation. Thank you. Um, sorry, uh, due to your loss of internet, I missed your oh, really? uh, the, 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 the first half of your question, so uh, could you repeat? Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, okay. And the first question actually is about um, from this table that uh, we could find the significant differences about those other modes. So can you explain a little bit more about whether there is a significant decrease uh, from the your simulated scenario with the actual uh, the actual case of the COVID nineteen case? Okay. Um. So uh, for your first question, um, uh, on this table, uh, this just um a comparison between the simulated uh results of this uh. Uh, of the simulated COVID-19 pandemic uh, with the actual data released by the Tourism Research Australia on their website. And uh, on the uh, on their uh, official website, um, uh, their documentation reports that um, the, uh, on June quarter last year, the actual uh, usage of car are higher up to uh, 91% and uh, the air usage uh, the air usage is just uh, 6% and others are 3%. And our simulated uh, results uh, indicates that um, in such a simulated COVID-19 pandemic, um, the car usage is uh, uh, around 85% and the, um, and the air usage is around 5.6%, uh, 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 which are uh, uh, the error rate for these two modes uh are at um uh, very low uh, level and uh for the other for the other uh, transportation mode uh, which i uh, explained just now um the low accuracy may be attributed to the general selection of variable uh, explanatory variables uh cannot uh, capture the full characteristics uh, of all transportation modes uh included in other transportation modes because uh, it would include uh, the water uh, and some railways uh, like rail etc uh, does it make sense or yeah so you explain maybe they are your model are quite suitable for the mode of car and air but not for the other travel modes yeah because um there are uh because you know um uh, in australia the uh, a car is the dominant uh, transportation mode in Australia. So, uh, and for others, it, it just can construct a, a very minor part. So, um, uh, my model would be suitable for uh, uh, for car and air trips, but for uh, for uh, others transportation mode, it should be uh, it should be another uh, it should be another study. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Any other questions? There are no questions, then we'll move on to the final presentation. So we will. Thank you, Thank you Xinming. If you can stop sharing your screen. Thank you. So our final presentation is uh, factors that affect teleworking and travel mode shift in a pandemic. So it'll be presented by Kashayar Kavarian. He's a PhD student in the Department of Civil Engineering at the Sharif University of Technology 
and his main topic of research is transportation planning. He's also involved in teaching city transportation planning and network design to urban planning master students at the University of Art. And it's with these uh, students from the University of Art that he's been working on uh, research. And this paper is a result of that work that he's been doing over a year. So um, I'm not sure if uh, Kashai will be presenting himself because of the internet connection or should I be playing his presentation? Um, hi, Dia, thank you for your introduction. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I think I can present um, if nothing okay. happens wrong. Yes, okay, that will be better because otherwise if I share, then I have to share the sound and it's more of a complex process. So we'll start with you and if there's any problems, then I can start sharing from my side. Okay, thank you. Okay. So let me just share my um, presentation here. Okay, you can see now the presentation? Yes, we can. Okay. So hello, everyone. Um, I'm Khasher, and I'm here to present you the results of our study on factors and effect uh, teleworking and travel mode shift in pandemic. Um, so during lockdowns everywhere teleworking was some kind of obligatory and public transport was limited or closed. But after the lockdowns finished, not uh, um, every company and not every country decided to um, still um, go for teleworking and uh, different things happened. For uh, Iran, the case was um, not so many people decided to do, go and do their jobs on the telework basis, and they um, still tried to go to the work. Um, so we decided to find out which group of people are, avoid, are avoiding telework during the pandemic, although they have the possibility of it. And also we decided to find out that uh, which group of people are avoiding the pr private modes instead of, for example, public uh, transport modes uh, that would uh, put them in risk of getting COVID uh, infection. Um, our study is uh, from June and July 2020, and um, there were um, some misunderstandings about the COVID back then. Uh, many people still believe that it would be a soon ending problem. And um, it was not for only for um, our country, for example, for the USA, uh, Forbes says that um, the following uh, coronavirus guidelines is not really good at that time. For example, in the April 2020, the average grade of the following in that country would be C from A to F. Um, unfortunately, we do not have any uh, kind of a map for following the guidelines over here in our country um, to present here. About uh, teleworking and before the pandemic, um, so many countries were working uh, on the telework basis. Uh, as you can see, for example, 30% of workers in some European countries uh, were occasionally or regularly teleworking. Uh, it is claimed that 20% in the USA were also teleworking. Uh, for countries with um, less development, uh, like Argentina, the number of teleworkers were low. And also in some well-developed countries like uh, France, um, due to some um, issues like uh, the softwares they were needed for their teleworking, um, there was not so much of teleworking going on. For our case, uh, for the uh, case of Iran, um, as we searched through the literature, um, some people just knew about the possibility of teleworking and they uh, really weren't doing anything about that. Um, in the literature, the factors that affect teleworking um, is divided to two uh, factors, constraints and drivers. Um, constraints, as you can see, um, includes job unsuitability, unavailable technology, and lack of awareness, uh, which uh, was the first reason that we didn't have any um, teleworking before pandemic in Iran. And uh, for the drivers, it was mainly mentioned that the mobility limitation of the person and the presence of the family in the 
home was the two drivers that uh, would make people to like to telework. Um, it was stated, for example, in a research in 2020 that well-educated and individual with children, their families are more likely to telework, but uh, these results are not conclusive. And um, I would present you some other results that says uh, people with, without children are more likely to uh, telework. For the less developed countries, um, um, like for example, Turkey, uh, we saw some literature that says that women are more interested in uh, doing telework. As I told you, um, patterns aren't constant in different literature and different cultures. So we have another study that says that uh, parents are less likely to telework and also says that married people are less likely to telework. So um, by concluding all these findings, we can see that the regular teleworkers are young uh, people who are uh, almost wealthy and also well paid, have well paid jobs. Um, with that in mind, we can go to the literature on the pandemic and see that um, uh, literature on the pandemic is for uh, before the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, see that people with low income and those who ride public transport for long distances are the most vulnerable group in getting infected. Um, so our regular uh, teleworkers are safe um, because they are teleworking and also be, because they are young and wouldn't be hit uh, so hard by a virus. Um, but uh, we have a problem with other people who are not teleworking and uh, ride the public transport. Um, with the COVID-19 pandemic, people start to react um, accordingly. And by accordingly, I do not mean to, for example, buy stuff in so many things, um, in so many, so huge amounts. Uh, I mean by, for example, uh, wearing a mask, uh, avoiding public gathering, and also um, teleworking. But that wasn't uh, for 100% of the society. And uh, to understand what's going on over here, we were supposed to um, conduct a survey. Um, since we do not have a um, platform or a list of individuals and volunteers that um, are willing to answer such surveys, for example, for data gatherings or these studies, uh, we have to conduct a broad journal survey in uh, our country and also do not uh, spread or uh, get the COVID uh, virus. Um, the only solution to that would be the social media and um, an online survey that we were sending out uh, the link uh, to everybody we can. We tried to ask Instagram influencer to post our survey. We asked um, channels on Telegram, which is a popular uh, social media over here. And we decided to um, get more involved with the surveying. So we went to open areas like entrance areas of residential building and parks uh, to safely ask people to answer our questions about uh, their working and commuting habits. Um, after 30 days of data gathering, we got 1,028 1, 20, uh, clicks on our survey, which means a um, number, good number of people have looked at our study survey. Uh, the complete uh, surveys uh, with at most one or two uh, empty questions was more than 600, which is more than 50% of answer rate. I think it's a good answer rate for our study. 68% of our respondents were uh, women and 32% were male. 32% um, were married uh, people. Average family size that uh, we find in our sample was uh, more than three people. Um, the respondent's age was from 13 to 78, but uh, we eliminated the students, teachers, and university professors, unless they have uh, some other jobs in addition to those uh, mentioned. Therefore, the age of the study, the age of the respondents of this study um, become from 18 to 78. Um, the number of um, surveyed private company or government employees was 317. These people are important to our study because we assume that the only people who are capable of doing um, teleworking in their uh, job uh, are these people. 
um, as I told, uh, the students, teacher, and university professors were uh, eliminated because they were obliged to um, do the teleworking. Uh, from these 300, uh, more than 300 people, only 20 people declared that uh, they are teleworking on a regular basis, and it's 6%. Uh, we decided to check our finding with other countries and find out that, uh, for example, a study from Japan shows that um, telework has increased from 6% in January 2020 to 17% in June. And also they have mentioned that uh, in Europe, there are, for example, countries with uh, more than 37% um, of teleworking. Um, I think uh, without that, uh, it's a good amount of teleworking share that we have over here in Iran because we are not as developed as these countries. And also uh, we do not know if uh, their result is without those teachers and university professors that we eliminated or not. So uh, we continued our study with these gathered data. Uh, beside the teleworking, as I mentioned, we want to understand how people choose from, uh, choose from the available uh, transportation modes. Uh, so we find out that uh, one, more than 140 people have changed um, their transportation mode to a more private one. Uh, for asking about the transportation mode, um, over here, uh, some people may have a personal car, but they do not use it regularly or daily for the work trips. Um, for example, maybe they would use their personal car for three days a week, and then mm, um, for some reasons that we do not know, they would take the subway for the other three days of their week. So they are both the public transport users and uh, the public, but the private vehicle users. Um, so if um, these people has eliminated their, uh, for example, subway usage and um, replace it by, for example, taking a taxi in those days that, that they do not use their car and they have done uh, something good toward preventing their uh, COVID infection. For uh, understanding the factors that are affecting uh, the decisions of people on these choices, we developed some uh, binary and multinomial logic models. Uh, for example, for the first uh, choice variable, which is choose to telework or not, we developed uh, four binary models, uh, which has some um, different sets of variables in order to make sure that the variables uh, values aren't uh, accidentally or aren't uh, by some problems, that doesn't have some problems. Um, I briefly go through the variables uh, definitions. Uh, the two first variables in this table are about the previous uh, transportation modes of the people. Um, so as I just mentioned, uh, driving a PC, uh, driving a personal vehicle or uh, being driven by a a uh, household member to the workplace uh, is possible for someone who um, also uses uh, subway in some other days. Um, these are the these two uh, variables are two variables that uh, haven't been um, in the previous telework studies because um, they're hasn't been a, a change in their attitudes when they were studying, but now we have the COVID, so we have a change. Uh, we have a factor that would affect um, the, the teleworking on both choice of the people. Um, so that's the first time in a study about the telework that um, the previous mode of transport is uh, accounted for. Um, there is age of the respondent and the place of the resident. Um, living in Tehran or Isfahan means that they are living in uh, populous cities because the Tehran is the capital with more than 9 million people. And Isfahan is the third biggest city in Iran with more than 1 million uh, inhabitants. Um, a number of household members that have to be at home while the pandemic is going on and number of household bugs. And uh, the, last the last variable is uh, derived, from a, um, derived from a Likert question, which is um, 
to believe that the commuting is very dangerous. Um, so looking for these variables that uh, there are a filter around them, you can see them, there are some elimination, there are some difference in these models uh, regarding these variables to check, uh, to see if the effect is for real. For example, uh, living in Tehran is uh, almost significant in all of the uh, calibrated models. Uh, so um, we can say that living in populous cities would reduce the probability of uh, teleworking um, and uh, living in small cities, as you can see, uh, would increase the probability. Um, number of household bikes doesn't have any significant result, but uh, as you can see down here on the fit value of the model, eliminating the number of household bikes would uh, decrease the fit of the model. So we, as we decided to keep it in the model and uh, believing that commuting is very dangerous really doesn't have any significant result on the teleworking choice of the people. And that would be a um, point that people do not do uh, what they believe. Um, as I told you, uh, the previous mode of transportation is also important. And as you can see, if somebody has a driving a personal car to the work or is driving, for example, half of the week to the work, uh, would have uh, uh, would have uh, lower probability of uh, teleworking uh, to the workplace. Mm, and that's it for these models. So I should go to the next. Uh, for the uh, choice of uh, mode change models, um, it's um, the dependent variable is uh, whether to choose, uh, whether to change the, from public to more uh, private one. Uh, as you can see, there are some other variables important over here. For example, uh, being a female is um, almost significant in our study. So uh, females are, are more likely to obey the guidelines by governments. Education level uh, being low would decrease the probability of um, changing to a safer mode of transportation. Living in big cities this time would increase the chance uh, of ha taking a preventive action. Uh, owning a car uh, would decrease um, the probability um, because they think they are in less uh, risk they are facing less risk of, risk of infection while they are not, uh, for example, um, using public transport for the rest of the week. Um, number of the people with uh, chronic illnesses in the family is also uh, increasing the probability of uh, this preventive action. Uh, as you can see, we have uh, two models over here. Uh, one of them has the variable of respondents on the car and the other one, uh, the model two has uh, the variable which, in, which shows that if the, um, if the respondent has driven to work pre-pandemic. Uh, as you can see, the only difference with these uh, models is the fit or rural square value. Um, owning a car doesn't uh, provide us a good explanation, sorry. Owning a car doesn't uh, provide us a good explanation of the data, but um, driving to the workplace pre-pandemic uh, would uh, provide us a better fit to the model. Um, to check for the um, correlation and the relation of the variables and the uh, effect to make sure that these variables are effective on the choices, we provided also a multinomial um, logit model here, uh, which uh, the uh, alternatives are choose to change from public to private mode, choose to telework or do nothing or do, um, which means not, not having a preventive action. Um, as you can see in the table, uh, two utilities are showed, do nothing, do nothing is the base. Uh, alternative, um, again, same variables are um, significant over here. For example, driving, uh, driving to work pre-pandemic um, is significant for both utility values, um, decreasing both probabilities of choosing any preventive actions or living in populous cities uh, or being driven by a household member to the workplace is also 
uh, decreasing the probability of taking any preventive actions. Um, so to conclude our study, I should say that um, people who aren't teleworking or not changing to safe modes over here in Iran are, mis uh, are, some kind, are mostly uh, men, um, those live in populous cities, uh, those uh, PC owners or pe personal vehicle owners who doesn't use that every day and sometimes use public transportation and people with uh, secondary level or lower education are not following the guidelines properly. And these are almost in line with the previous literature on, uh, for example, uh, decisions on in the time of a crisis um, that has been studied. Uh, so I think uh, if there is any policy to promote telework over here, uh, these are the group of people who are uh, supposed to be targeted. Thank you for your time and attention. I'm ready to answer your question. Thank you for that interesting presentation. It was a lot of interesting data there. Uh, thank you, Peshawar. And uh, we'll wait for any questions from the audience. No questions? It seems people are tired of the end of this two hour session now. Okay, it seems there are no questions, Peshar. If there are any questions, of course, you can send it through chat or uh, send it through emails. I'm sure in the agenda you have emails of all the authors and participants available. If you want to collaborate or reach out to anyone, if you come up with questions later on. So um, I'll leave it at that. And uh, thank you everyone for participating in the third BTR conference and uh, for your interesting papers and insights and also some related to the current pandemic situation as well. Um, I think the next, uh, next session starts at two and Professor jo Jonathan Cochran will be moderating that session. So I will, I think I need to stay in the room till he takes over. So if you want to ask questions to each other, I'll be here, but uh, there are no more presentations. We've ended the session, but I can't end the meeting because it's the same meeting room for the next session. Okay, good afternoon, folks. Either welcome back or welcome to um, the final of, of set, the final part of uh, Track Three A session. So, part the first part was uh, moderated by Dia, uh, and the second part is going to be moderated by myself. I'm Jonathan Corcoran from UQ. Um, so, what we have in front of us today um, are four papers, um, and so we're going to kick off with Amir. Uh, then with myself, uh, Ronnie, and then Shahia um, for the rest of today's session. So if you are new to the session, you, um, um, you haven't heard Dia's uh, introduction before, uh, papers are 20 minutes long. 
Um, what I'll do is just give a three minute warning and then a one minute warning as we sort of move towards the end of the session. Um, in terms of questions, could I ask you to uh, sort of type them into the chat channel and, and pop your hand up when we get into, into questions and we'll sort of try and curate the questions at the end of each paper, if that's possible. So the first paper is by Amir. Now, Amir might not possibly be here. Amir, are you, are you able to make it online? I understand possibly not. So what I was gonna do was um, a little bit of introduction to the first paper. So Amir's paper, who's, who's being presenting, I've got a recording of this, is an evaluation of freight transportation regulation, uh, a particular case study of a RAN trucking sector. Um, just a bit of a brief bio on Amir. So Amir is an associate professor at the Sharif uh, University of Technology in Iran. <clears throat> he has 10 years professional experience in the transport planning and engineering sector, receiving his PhD in 2010 from the University of Illinois at Chicago, where he served as the main researcher behind the development of the freight demand forecasting model that is now used widely in the US. So during his professorship at Sharif University of Technology, he's been involved in more than 25 projects on passenger and freight uh, demand models, data mining, statistical analysis and micro simulation and their application in the transportation and planning and management sectors. Uh, in 2015, he was recognized as the best young professor in uh, industrial relations. So with no further ado, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop this share and I'm gonna take us over to um, Amir's presentation, hopefully with slickness um, in Zoom. So let me, do this and let me hope equally that this this does share um, the sound correctly so if people could just let me know if they can't hear this uh, hello this everybody playing. and thank you for participating in this uh, session of the PTR uh, conference this is Amir Samimi from Sharif University of Technology uh, I'm going to present uh, a research on the uh, evaluation of different uh, regulation policies in the trucking uh, sector of Iran uh, using a, um, a using an agent-based microsimulation in uh, any logic software. Uh, in this presentation, I will cover the motivation. Then I will quickly review the data and method used in the simulation and I will go to the results next. Uh, then I will discuss the uh, regulatory scenarios uh, based on the uh, simulation model and then uh, we will have the concluding points. Uh, the uh, trucking sector industry uh, is very uh, significant uh, part of the economy in, or in Iran it has uh, over 500,000 uh, drivers with uh, 400,000 trucks and 4,400 trucking companies. Uh, although this is a significant part of the economy, and actually this is the backbone of the uh, industry, uh, it has several deficiencies uh, that uh, could be summarized in terms of the utilization of the trucks, uh, empty backhauls, air pollution, and uh, most significantly, uh, very, very tiny share of um, market, market share of each trucking company. Even the largest uh, trucking company in, Ir in Iran has uh, just above 4% of the uh, market share of the country. Uh, part of the uh, deficiencies uh, that exist in the trucking sector um, actually um, is rooted in the uh, regulation uh, vision of the government. Uh, there is a geographical limitation uh, for the trucking sector, meaning that uh, the origin of the shipments depend on the, on the type of license and most of the trucking companies can only uh, issue a bill of lading for a shipment uh, with the same origin as the company uh, province. 
there are uh, another um, uh, limitation in the sector that uh, more than one third of the demand uh, that is uh, originated from uh, major cities um, are uh, going through uh, something that is called mandatory announcement halls. Uh, in such uh, announcement halls, uh, there is no choice for the shipper to choose the carrier. Uh, so it is uh, a first come, first serve uh, queue. Uh, these are <coughs> actually some uh, uh, regulatory uh, issues that exist in the trucking sector and can be um, and, and can affect the performance of the trucking sector in general. Uh, so the strict regulations uh, leads to the uh, very uh, numerous small trucking companies because the uh, scale economy that exists in the uh, freight transportation could not be benefited in such uh, an economic environment. The trucking sector cannot shape uh, trip chains uh, because they cannot uh, issue bill of lading uh, anywhere in the country. There are certain geographical limitations and there is a mandatory freight announcement hall. Uh, so there is a uh, question here. Uh, what if we um, revise the um, regulation scenarios. What if we remove the geographical limitation? What will happen if we uh, remove the restriction of the freight announcement halls? And what is the impact of uh, such um, adjustments on the regulatory uh, reform uh, on the overall performance of the system? Uh, there is another point here that if we remove the geographical limitations, and if you remove the mandatory freight announcement halls, the freight, uh, the uh, trucking companies will begin uh, forming trip chains. Uh, they will start solving uh, the so-called uh, pickup delivery problem uh, because there is uh, significant uh, economic benefits here. Uh, they can increase the utilization, they can decrease the empty backhauls. So we will cover these questions here. Uh, uh, in, the, in the coming, I'll, I will discuss uh, the three uh, items uh, here uh, that, that I will discuss uh, in further detail in, in the scenarios. Uh, so, uh, in this research, we made a micro simulation, uh, an agent based model to simulate the uh, you know, trucking sector uh, behavior. Uh, the uh, trucking companies, the drivers, etc., and, and other players, the shippers. And we added a uh, PDP, pick up the re delivery problem solution here, because as I noted earlier, uh, the trucking company will start solving the PDP problem as soon as they get rid of the geographical limitations and the uh, mandatory announcement halts. So we will combine these two modules to uh, analyze the scenarios. Uh, we have a huge database here. Uh, all the 29 million records of each shipment uh, for an entire year. Uh, the information of 400,000 trucks and 4,400 trucking companies. So we have a fairly large disaggregated data set here. Uh, we <coughs> Uh, selected a stratified uh, random sample, a 20% stratified sample, uh, because uh, to, to save the runtime and uh, you know uh, increase the efficiency of the code. Uh, and actually, that doesn't uh, really that much uh, change the results. So we have a 20% sample of the population. Uh, we have. A lot of information here, the origin and destination of every individual shipment, type of the commodity, weight. Uh, we have the truck type, capacity, uh, some information of the driver, etc. And we have the information of the trucking company, the market share, the type of license that the company has, etc. Uh, so um, the, the uh, sample that uh, we built or model upon that uh, has 
894 companies and almost uh, 7.4 million uh, shipments um, and we have 7,000 company owned trucks and uh, 4,500 owner operator trucks so in a uh, bottom up approach we try to model the company behavior and the shipper behavior and the driver's behavior and consider all the inter interactions uh, in this environment and see uh, how the overall uh, behavior of the system is. Um, okay, so um, from a conceptual perspective, uh, we have uh, different models for a truck. For example, uh, we actually integrated the, the vehicle and the driver, uh, so we have one agent as the truck, so the driver's decisions are also integrated in the truck. Uh, these purple boxes are decisions that are modeled here based on the uh, data set that we have. Uh, we made a model for price determination uh, to decide whether or not to accept an order and uh, another model to uh, decide whether or not uh, make an empty travel. So when a driver or a truck receive an order, uh, the driver um, offers a price to the company or to the shipper uh, and decide whether or not to accept the, uh, the order. And um, go if the offer is accepted, it will go, go ahead and load the uh, shipment, continue the trips until the truck is free again. And if, the, if a driver waits for a long time, uh, the driver will decide whether or not to have an empty travel. Uh, the same will happen for the shipper. Uh, the shipper uh, will request for a, uh, uh, for a driver or a company, decide on the truck type based on the commodity, uh, submit a request and get the information. Uh, there will be some uh, bidding models on the price uh, so the winner will uh, take the uh, shipments and continue the simulation and uh, finally the shipments each specific shipment will exit and um, uh, get out of the simulation uh, and for the company the company should decide how to allocate the trucks to the shipments and also uh, in a uh, bidding model should decide the shipping price. Uh, so we uh, have uh, several statistical models here. For example, uh, in a log-log price model, the company offers a price for a specific shipment based on the distance, weight, competitiveness of the market, and whether or not the city, the origin of the shipment, has a mandatory freight announcement hall. As you see, uh, in the cities that we have mandatory announcement halls, the price is, is larger. Actually, it increases the price, the offering price of the company by 24.5%. Um, I will not go to the details. Uh, the same similar model for the truck driver to offer a price. Um, another model here uh, for the driver to decide to have an empty travel based on the day that the driver has waited for a shipment and based on the location uh, uh, of the uh, driver, whether the driver is uh, in his hometown or uh, in, the in the very demanding cities. Uh, so there is a dummy variable here for location and a continuous variable for for the number of days that the driver is waiting. And finally, the truck allocation is an optimization model for the pickup delivery problem. We developed a heuristic model to solve this part. Uh, so every shipment enters a queue and calls the company uh, trucks. First, uh, each company calls the company on trucks. Uh, if the uh, drivers are busy with other shipments or they cannot agree on the price based on the uh, bidding model, 
uh, the company will call the under contract trucks uh, and if it doesn't get accepted by uh, by the drivers it will finally call for the owner operator trucks and the loop will continue until the shipments uh, get assigned to a uh, driver and a truck and continue the uh, simulation uh, in the uh, pickup delivery problem we formulated a multi-vehicle pickup delivery problem with time window so this is a very complex problem very time consuming uh, it could have very uh, various objective functions uh, it has a very broad literature uh, we developed a heuristic model a simulated uh, annealing uh, model uh, with a uh, neighborhood search algorithm this is a combined uh, heuristic model to solve the optimization I will not go to the details uh, just you can see this as a box to solve the um, pickup delivery problem solver uh, when we put this all together and run the simulation we can see uh, that the number of shipments distance traveled etc are observed from the data and we have some simulated values these are the error terms that we get from the observed versus the simulated values these are pretty much close uh, and if we just uh, plot the observed uh, and real uh, and simulated values uh, we can see the R, uh, R squared values 85% 84% 92% which is pretty much close uh, of course it could be improved further and uh, there are some underestimation in the upper tail of the distribution but we can pretty much accept the results for um, now having the simulation we can uh, compare different scenarios uh, the white boxes are, are the uh, current situation the gray boxes are the scenario in which the mandatory holes are removed and uh, there is uh, no geographical limitations uh, in the uh, yellow boxes uh, we added national companies national level companies are the ones that can freely uh, issue bill of lading across the country and in the purple boxes uh, we have the national companies uh, that are optimizing the pick pickup delivery problem as you can see here uh, when we have the uh, optimization with no limitation the market share of the top 50 companies increase from 20% to 45% uh, or as another example when you for example uh, optimize the routes and uh, remove the limitations uh, the average waiting time to find a career uh, decreases from 28 hours to 21 hour you can see other figures here uh, now if you uh, specifically look at the uh, under management trucks uh, meaning that these are the trucks that are that uh, have a specific contract to the company uh, they are more productive here the average productivity for these trucks increases from 21 percent to 30 percent uh, they have uh, an average percent of empty travel distance of 1 to 1.2 percent compared to the 4 percent for the status quo uh, but their salary doesn't increase that much it is it increases from 35.9 uh, to 36.9 um, we observed that when the um, market gets more uh, competitive uh, actually the shipping cost in general decreases not the, the company's uh, revenue and uh, the companies enter the competition by reducing their costs uh, or exit the market so this is the reason that uh, we see more productivity but it doesn't uh, change the uh, average monthly income and if you look at the owner operator trucks you can see that uh, they get worse uh, their productivity decreases from 20% to 15% uh, 
uh, meaning that the owner operator trucks are motivated to join the companies and uh, individual uh, economic activity in this market uh, doesn't have that much economic gain so this is a direct result of the uh, regulation here uh, in order to uh, run this simulation we had to uh, make some assumptions this is a huge model with several statistical and economical models for example we had to assume a number for the share of national companies uh, understandably when the limitation the geographical limitations and the uh, mandatory hull limitation is removed uh, the companies start to grow uh, they have economic incentives to expand their uh, actually uh, activity um, so uh, we assumed uh, an increase for the share of uh, national companies and several other parameters that you can see here uh, we have no uh, actually basis uh, in terms of the statistical models or a quantitative evidence for these assumptions uh, so we run uh, some sensitivity analysis on the assumed values I'm almost out of time uh, I will give you one example uh, for the percentage of the national companies in the basic scenario we assume the 2% we again uh, uh, check the sensitivity of this assumption increase it to 4 and then to 6% and you can see how the outputs uh, change when the uh, this assumption is uh, increased from 2 to 4 and 6 uh, this sensitivity analysis is uh, again repeated for the share of uh, uh, fleet share of the national companies uh, and other assumed values in conclusion we can see that uh, the type of uh, regulation policies that the government make in the trucking sector could significantly change uh, the players behavior uh, we can change the motivation of the uh, truck drivers to be owner operator or to join a big firm we can change the motivation of the trucking company to work very locally or to expand across the country uh, and decrease the uh, ba empty backhauls. Uh, so uh, we actually uh, see that we can quantify the impact of different deregulation scenarios on the performance, overall performance of the uh, market. Um, I will be happy to take any a question on this presentation thank you for your okay thank you Amir um, <clears throat> so that brings us to the end of Amir's presentation um, as Amir is not able to sort of join us I'm sort of mindful obviously about the, the capacity to respond to any questions but what I would ask is if you could put your questions down in the chat box what I'll do is I'll collate those at the end of the presentation I'm happy then to sort of park I push them over to Amir for, for, for response. Um, so I think that sort of wraps up presentation one. Um, the next presentation is um, from myself um, and I'll just put up those slides now. Bear with me two seconds while we navigate the delights. Here we go. So hopefully that's coming through. Coming through okay. Ah, so Amir is online. So Amir, are you there? Oh, I just heard from someone else in the in the room that. Okay, look, I think in terms of sort of time, if you could put your, um, your, your questions into the chat channel, um, then I'll, I'll, I'm happy to sort of move those along to um, uh, Amir as in, in due course. So this, the second paper is a slight sort of departure from what we were talking about before. Um, so there's myself, um, and I'd like to recognize the co-authors, Renee Min and, and Jinping as part of this work. So a little bit of background about me. I'm 
Um, so I'm a professor in, in human geography at the School of Earth and Environmental Sciences at the University of Queensland. Um, I run the um, Queensland Centre for Population Research. And previously I got my PhD out of the UK uh, back in 2003 before being what really is just a climate migrant um, and, and certainly a great opportunity to come to, to Australia and be part of uh, UQ, uh, which I did in 2005 um, on a three-year plan that turned out either I can't count very well um, or um, it's, it's a pretty good place. And I think the latter has certainly been uh, um, something I felt very strongly about uh, UQ and, and being part of um, the Australian academic. Uh, scene. Uh, but what I want to talk to you about today um, is this thing called familiar strangers. So I'm going to ask you to indulge me um, for a few moments um, and, and think about the last time you jumped on public transport and probably a pre-COVID day, right? The last time you were on public transport and the number of people who you recognize on your regular bus, your regular train or your regular ferry. Um, but you recognize that you've never had verbal contact with them. And this is what we dub the familiar stranger. And so what I'm going to do in the next sort of 15 to 20 minutes is, is tell you a story about A, the role of them, B, the social consequences and importance of familiar strangers, and then further to that, the role that we can have in terms of um, the analytics. So mapping, measuring and monitoring these things called familiar strangers. So I, I want to start by sort of talking about a reasonably rather nebulous concept, this idea of livable cities, and, and really start thinking about um, the ways in which we measure our cities and, and the way in which, you know, our smart cities are wired in terms of sort of understanding and monitoring the way in which places are used and people interact with various entities that exist across our city spaces. But reflecting on that, to some extent and, and sort of moving back to what Osterman said back in 75, I think is a really important point, which is if we're going to understand our city, then we need to understand the patterns of activities in which urban residents singularly and collectively engage. And where Osterman was going with this and where I think the important link is, is the interaction between social life and the physical elements of our, our, our city. The picture on our right hand side is that of Melbourne, and really that sort of talks to this point in that there's a myriad of different mosaics of urban land use and they act to, or the physical features that form our urban environment act to produce urban spaces that frame our daily activities. It is the parks, it is the train stations that funnel people into these particular places at particular times. And when we start to consider how we use and how we engage with these places, though, those, those sort of engagements and our attachment to those sorts of places matter when we think about our neighborhoods and our cities of being livable or not. So livable cities is the, the rather broad nebulous concept that I'm gonna be talking about, or at least two. And what I really want to now talk about is with that broader veneer of, of, of uh, livable cities is, is really starting to think about the social consequences of population presence. And when we think about going back to those, those, those bus stops, those train stations, those ferry stops that we're getting on and getting off with and transiting through our cities, um, it, each place within our urban environments has its own intrinsic rhythm that effectively shaped by these population flows. So we've got our peak hours, we've got our weekdays, our weekends, our holiday periods and so forth. And these population dynamics, these temporary population flows um, vary in form and function depending upon the nature of the place. So parks are very different to transit stations, which are different to um, civic squares and different, different to um, uh, shopping centers. But it's these daily flows of, of, of population that give rise to a varying different um, sets of opportunities for good things and bad things. And I want to talk about the bad things in today's presentation, which is crime. And so the population presence in particular places at particular times give rise to these opportunities for bad things to happen by either facilitating or impeding the co-presence of um, offenders, guardians and targets. So for crime to occur, we know that we need um, the presence of an opportunity and the absence of an offender for that to be coalescing in space and time for crime to occur. So there are social consequences for pop 
population presence. And that brings me to this point of familiar strangers. And again, thinking back to the situation that you imagined at the beginning, that train station, that bus stop or that ferry stop that you get on or get off and you recognize people, but you've never had verbal contact. So it's these repeated cursory encounters that we have in our lives and our daily lives, which we're, we're very familiar with these things called familiar strangers. We know the lady in the red hat, the guy with the blue shoes, who is at the train station, who we recognize but have never spoken or verbally interacted with. And the point of connection between the social consequences and familiar strangers is the question whether or not familiar strangers have an important social role to play in terms of mitigating um, crime, or at least providing some protective effects around stopping crime happening. So what we know from scholarship is that increased familiarity among individuals has certain sorts of social benefits at places. And what it does is it reduces anonymity and it enhances our moral obligation to obey behavioral norms, which in turn we would hypothesize would have some sort of crime protection effect, but we don't know. And so that brings us to the aim of the current study, which was to unpack the nuances of this population presence. So what is uh, the tempo, the timing, and the intensity of familiar strangers and its role in crime protection? The image I'm projecting in the back there is from an early 1970s study by the rather famous um, sociologist uh, Stanley Milgram, uh, who did exactly this, but he did it um, in a, in a, a ra rather isolated setting, given the tech technologies and the data available that time. So he took a photograph at a, at a, at a train station, numbered all these people um, that were standing on the station, then went back a week later and asked the individuals, do you recognize anyone on the station? The answer to that question was approximately three quarters, sorry, people that identified re or recognizing three quarters of the other people present on the station at a given time. So again, think about when you go to the train station yourself or the bus or the ferry, how many people on average, and do this next time you're there, how many people approximately would you recognize but don't actually, or haven't had any verbal contact with? An interesting kind of case. Stanley Milgram in 1972 established that it was around about three quarters of the people were recognized by one other person. So we wanted to take that kind of that, that, that sort of idea and, and, and have a look at this, but not just at a single station, track this for um, an entire metropolitan area across uh, public transit stops. So the study context, just to give you an idea why we're talking about, uh, where Brisbane is up in the top little uh, left map there, the little graticule up in the top. Uh, Brisbane uh, is a population of around about 2.2-ish million, 2.172.2 million. It sits within a broader southeast Queensland region of about three and a half million people, um, with, with Queensland itself being just under five. Units of analysis were the, the finest spatial units that we can get in the Australian census, which were mesh blocks, and they are effectively um, land use units. So they're, they're, they're attributed one, with one of six land use categories. We've got all crime incidents that have happened by day, and then we've also got passenger flows by day, by stop. So how do we get each of these um, passenger flows? Then we got passenger flows from smart card data. So here in Brisbane, we've got the go card um, and go card is um, our principal way of getting transit information. It captures um, tap ons and tap offs. Uh, and so what we did from that data uh, was to get passenger presence. So we, we were trying to capture how many people were at a given stop and traveling along a particular route um, using the go-card data. Um, the other three items were to capture the, the sort of the socio-demographic and, and, and environmental characteristics of the immediate bus stop environment. So that's within 100 meters around a bus stop. So we're looking at bus stops in this particular study. And then the walkable area around the bus stop. So up to 400 meters, again, getting the, the, the sort of the built and the natural environment characteristics of what this walkable area is. And then the final layer was um, that of the neighborhood. Um, and so we were using the, the kind of effectively the suburbs that sit around each bus stop. And again, we're interested in the socio-demographic and the economic characteristics of the neighborhood. Crime type wise, we're interested in three different types of crime. 
So property theft, drug offences and good order offences, all of which we would hypothesise would have some relationship between passenger presence. And so passenger presence can mean one of two things, more opportunity, but equally we could hypothesise when there's a great, a, a higher number of familiar strangers within those um, passengers that are present and travelling on these routes, that would have some sort of crime protective effect. Models. We've used um, a set of negative binomial models. They're spatially nested. So we've used multi-level models with robust standard errors. So that's the data on which we based um, this particular study. Um, given I'm a geographer, we always like kind of maps. So the, the graticles that you see on the left actually min generated this one of the co-authors and produced three, oh, sorry, four lovely maps. Um, and so as it relates to familiar strangers, so that's uh, a familiar stranger is um, two individuals who have encountered each other two or more times during our study period. So we've got a nine day study period, which comprises five weekdays and four weekend days. The reason why we've only got a nine day study period is that computationally, it's pretty horrible. Um, and so weekday encounters, we're looking at just under three million weekday encounters across Brisbane, which you can see highlighted in grey in, in each of the four maps, and just over a quarter of a million weekend encounters. And so from the maps, we can start to unpick where the higher intensity of those familiar stranger encounters are happen happening, both at the bus stop and along what particular routes. And so each of the red lines that you see on any three of those, only one of those four maps is indicating the higher intensities of, of familiar stranger encounters. And so you can see inbound, the top two, and then outbound, the out, inbound to the CBD, so Brisbane City, or outbound from Brisbane City. Interestingly, um, we start to find some really interesting sort of patterns embedded here. So on weekdays, um, unlike Stanley Milgram, who found 75% in the Brisbane context, we were, we were finding around 60% of individuals um, recorded at least one familiar stranger. And that lasted approximately 17 minutes whilst traveling along that particular bus line. On weekends, as we'd expect, that's less. So familiar stranger encounters about 40% of individuals record at least one familiar stranger encounter. And the average time is less, around about 13 minutes. So that's what they look descriptively. In terms of the negative binomial results, then this is what comes out of the study. So we do find that familiar strangers indeed have that crime buffering effect. So they do have that protective effect across all the three types of crime examined. So on average, bus stops where there's a higher concentration of familiar strangers, there are fewer counts of theft, drug defences and good order offences. We rationalise this within the sociological and criminological literature um, that familiar strangers leads to lower crime by reducing anonymity, which in turn increases the moral obligation for behavioral norm adherence. And in, in doing so reduces offended or in, enhances guardianship capacity, capacity by encouraging surveillance and intervention when problems arise. So familiar strangers in some is a good thing. It reduces crime. I'm gonna sum up quite quickly because I realize I'm sort of moving towards the end of, end of my time here. So coming back to that bigger concept of livable cities, um, we, we need to recognize that cities around the world continue to strive to reconfigure themselves in a way that invokes higher levels of sustainability, that sort of environmental, economic, and social. And, and in doing so, sort of uh, heading towards more livable cities that invoke higher levels of well-being. And so when we're thinking about redesigning our metropolitan areas, we first need to understand how those subtle daily lives of individual citizens play out across both space and time. And familiar strangers or encounters more generally form the basis of social relationships and clearly have an important role to play what we found from our models so far in, in a context of the bus network. Um, and we need to do more in this space. So, Transport networks are a big part of our, let's say, pre-COVID normal daily lives. And so understanding some of these social implications of, of, of these experiences in bus stops, of which familiar strangers is one of them, is really important. And so hopefully you've seen at least a, 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 some embryonic work here 
how we've begun to firstly sort of measure and map them and, and, and how we can then go and sort of push this into a monitoring capacity where we can have a look at how pulses and changes of familiarity might have both pro and antisocial consequences across both finer spatial and temporal granularities and equally across cities. So what we're doing at the moment, you might remember we've had to restrict the current study to just nine days. We've now rebuilt this um, empirical approach that we can now look across three and five year periods. So we can have a look at the waxing and waning of familiar strangers over much broader granularities of time and also the relationship it has with, with, with crime. And so we can have a look at stability and change over those longer periods. We're in the process of moving this to have a look at different situational contexts as well as different types of public places. And of course, in the spirit of reproducibility, this is all being built uh, in an R framework for sharing. So a few references, and I'm just gonna say what we've done so far in this space, um, a big thank you. So thanks and happy to sort of take some questions. So a, a, question, a question from Mahmood, can you give more details on your negative binomial model? Other, than, yes, um, happy to do that. Um, I'm, it's a little tricky to sort of give fit um, in the way they were spatially nested multi-level models um, with a time invariant variable in there. I'm happy to, um, I'm, I'm happy to share with you the actual tables themselves, the fit parameters. It's probably a little tricky to put those up um, here, but I'm happy to share that paper directly with you. Anyone else? Any other questions? I know it's it's pushing on towards the end of Friday, so um, <laughs> everyone's um, very much um, um, willing to kind of uh, feel a little tired by the end of the week. If there's no other questions, what I might do is is hand over to our third presenter, which is um, Ronnie. And Ronnie's going to be talking to us about accessibility analysis of a public transit network to identify opportunities for demand responsive transport. And just a little bit of background on Ronnie. Ronnie Ronnie's a lecturer in mechatronics at Deakin University in Australia. Um, he specializes in mathematical modeling of physical systems for optimization, control, and automation. And he spent 10 years, the last 10 years or so, um, in research in intelligent transport systems, including vehicle and traffic mod modeling, traffic network control, and, tra and transport optimization. Um, he has experience working in both academia and industry, and has worked on both research and um, consultancy projects. So, so Ronnie, I'm gonna pass over to you and you should now have uh, control of the screen. You should be able to share your yep. um, bits and pieces. So over to you. Yep, all right, thank you very much. Just give me, trying to share the correct screen is all. Super, you're away. Just make Good. a little. All right. Uh, well, thanks very much uh, for the introduction, Jonathan. So, um, well, actually, uh, although the, the original title was about uh, public transport accessibility, but um, as it turns out, I've been misusing the word accessibility. <laughs> um, well, given my background actually in mechatronics and control systems theory. But anyway, um, so this work is about, um, we, we, we propose a new terms for it. So we're doing relative mobility analysis for public transport network. It's the same work, but uh, different terminology really. So uh, this work was done while I was still working at the Australian Road Research Board. And it was done uh, with um, several other colleagues here named in, in the slide, Subra um, and uh, Dixon Liao. So uh, the, well, the motivation for this work is that I just, I would like to, we would like to be able to see like what are the opportunities for us to be able to integrate the demand responsive transportation services into the public transport offerings rather than just looking at them as separate, well, services. Um, 
Right, so just, just to start with, I'm just going to tell you a little story um, about my commute. Sorry, just give me one second. I just like to remove this gallery view. There it goes. So I just would like to tell you a little bit of my story. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, while I was, which which actually you know make me think about this issue. So this was where I live in the western suburbs of um, Melbourne, and this is where where I used to work in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne. And as you can see, if I were to try to take um, a public transport uh, uh, services, I have to go to the uh, to the to the city centers, the CBD here, and then do some transfer. And then I have three options from then on. I can either go take the tram down the, the middle route here, or I can take the train down here and then take the bus up there, or the other way around. I take a different line, goes up there, and then take the bus to uh, down there. Um, so just to uh, show you the uh, the travel time of these three options. You can see that it's at least taking about one and a half hour to, to commute. Um, but given that this is pretty much an ideal scenario in, uh, in actuality, sometimes there are some delays and therefore I miss the connections. Plus this is actually departing at the train stations. Um, obviously I have to drive from my, from my home to the train station and find some parking and so on and so on. So in total, it could be almost two hours of public transport journey. Now compare that with uh, with a car travel, right? If I were to decide to drive and if I were to depart at the same time, roughly, uh, you can see it takes about uh, forty five minutes up to one and a half hours, right? Uh, based on experience, it usually takes me about one hour, one hour ten minutes stops, right? Um, and this is actually also me avoiding tollway. Because I don't want to pay the toll. So if I were to go to, if I use the tollway, then it will be a bit faster. Now, what I'm trying to illustrate here is that, in the, in my case, the the car travel is actually a lot faster than using the public transport. Now, so that really gets me to think: Is there a way that the, the demand responsive transport can help? You know, actually, I prefer to take the public transport because uh, therefore I can relax during the journey. I can read a book, I can play with my smartphone, or I can just take a short nap. But because of the time saving of car travel, I decided to drive. And it was quite, well, stressful, so to speak. Anyway, uh, here I just tried to quickly think up of several examples of maybe how demand responsive transport can help integrate into the public transport service or network. You can see in the first example, if we were to be able to bypass some um, some uh, downtown interchange that might be congested, and we we bypass that with the with the demand responsive transport, so that I can go to the other side, maybe that's one way. Um, and the current uh, currently the more popular way to develop um, demand responsive transport is as a first and last mile solution which is actually, you know, obviously working quite well. So it's, I think up to this point, but at, at the same time, there might be other opportunities to uh, use demand responsive transportation when the uh, the public transport network takes large detour ge geographically, therefore taking a long time. You know, in a public transport network shape that uh, akin to Melbourne's, to the one in Melbourne, which is hub and spoke pattern, uh, where everything has to go to the CBD before, you know, it goes out to the to the other suburbs. So um, with the lack of orbital routes, um, then demand responsive transport can perhaps play play a role in becoming those orbital routes informally. <clears throat> so um, this after that uh, motivation is a bit of an outline of my talk today. I'm just going to define all these relative mobility measure that I've used. Then I'm going to present some uh, a case study for Port Melbourne. Um, that is a suburb in Melbourne in particular, and just to discuss some future work. So what is relative mobility? So uh, essentially this relative mobility is a measure that uh, compares the speed of public transport versus car travels. 
again, as I said before, the idea is that I would like to identify the gaps in the public transport network, right? in a sense that which part of the public transport network is actually slower compared to car and they, therefore can potentially be a candidate for demand responsive transport services. Right, so, and the way I try to approach this problem is that I will, I'm putting myself, myself in the shoes of the users or the commuters, right? The idea is that um, the eventual goal is that I would like to try to encourage mode shift from people to car travels to public transport. And I think this is particularly important in Australian cities, capital cities, where the majority of commuters actually use car, private cars to, to go to work. Now, uh, there are actually two different types of measures that are proposed. One is called the point to point, and the other one is looking at particularly at the public transport lines. They are both complementary measures, one for looking at the area analysis, and the second one is looking at the trip analysis. I'll get into the details a, a little bit later. Now, however, before I actually go on, I just would like to present you the results first, right? So this is a map of Port Melbourne. And this shows you the different colors, shows you the different lines and the different areas with different levels of mobility. Now, perhaps you're asking why Port Melbourne? Now, because that office that was originally in the Eastern suburb have moved to Port Melbourne area. And this Port Melbourne area is actually just adjacent to the CBD, right? And this office, the office is actually located here, right? Um, so to me, when the office moved, it was a, it was a very good news. Right, it's a lot closer, and actually resolve that issue of you know having to transfer and going outbound, which is against the peak traffic. Right, so you might actually guess or think that, oh, okay, now Ronnie can actually take the public transport line, but actually still no, because unfortunately, the relative mobility to go to Port Melbourne is actually pretty low. If I were to drive, I can actually take this highway and take the exit here, and I'm pretty much there already. Whereas if I were to take the public transport, I still have to take the train, go to this uh, major train stops, uh, train station, which is called the Southern Cross train station. And from this, what I call as the hub stop, I will then have to take the bus here um, and go and walk from this bus stops here. Now you might see that this area here actually is considered as a poor mobility area, simply because there's very sparse in terms of the public uh, public transport stops location. You can see that there are only two lines in this area. And it, in addition to that, the public transport line itself is actually um, yellow. So it has average mobility in a sense. So the speed here of the bus travel is actually not too bad, but uh, the frequency is actually quite low and therefore it brings down the mobility a little bit more. So if you take the average of the speed, you know, sometimes you, if there's no service, then therefore you have to wait for a bit more before you can then take the next bus, if that makes sense. <clears throat> so um, uh, Jonathan, I'm not sure whether I should continue or just answer the question as I go along, but... Um, happy, happy to do. Uh, there's, there's a question that's coming from Niraj um, around your slide three, but we can we can leave that until the end of the presentation. It's up to you. Okay, in that case, I'll just wait until um, the end we of can, my presentation. We, we, can, we can store the questions. That's all good. All right, good. Thank you. So um, where was I? All right. Um, so that's pretty much a, a sneak peek into the results. Anyway, um, going back to the formulation, and this is the point-to-point -point measurements. So this is really just uh, looking at the origin and destinations and measure how much difference is this, you know, is the speed with um, when we're traveling uh, using public transport or car travel. So as I said before, it's considering an origin destination pair. And the idea is that I would just, I would like to measure different kind of uh, ratio. So we have the walking ratio, waiting ratio, and the travel time difference ratio into this so-called relative mobility measure. So the walking ratio here captures how much time we actually spend waiting during the public transport journey, right? And here is also penalizing how much time we actually spend waiting in the public transport journey. So the longer we actually walk or the longer we actually wait, 
it actually brings down the score of the relative mobility, meaning that we, you know, because when walking, waiting, it's actually relatively slow. Now, in terms, the, the last term here actually captures the difference, the travel time difference between the car and public transport. More specifically, this actually shows you what is the percentage of the public travel time, a public transport travel time can actually be shaved off if you decide to use the car. Or is it, for instance, if it's 20%, that means you can uh, save 20% of your time if you decide to, to switch to car. And the second measure is looking at this public transport line specifically. And this is really a measure of the slower parts of the public transport journeys. And in order for us to do this, uh, we consider breaking down the trip into multiple legs. And the idea is that we are trying to identify which one is the weakest link in that PT, uh, public transport journey. So just to give you a, a little bit of illustration, here is showing the velocity graph of different example of public transport journey. And therefore the steeper the gradient is, uh, the faster your speed, right? And as you can probably have guessed, this one he has the steepest uh, gradient and therefore this is actually a train ride, right? And this part here has the lowest gradient or the smallest gradient that is actually walking. Right, so I, I just trying to illustrate here that uh, by looking at the speed of each legs, then we can identify which part of the public transport journey is actually, you know, slowing you down. Right, so uh, in order for us to define it, like consider that we have a, a, a particular leg in a journey and with starting stop um, at S and then finishing at N, uh, stop E. And the, this measure is really just measuring the, um, uh, the speed difference between the public transport and the car travel. So here we have a average speed of the car travel from the stop S to E. And here's the speed of public transport trip from S to E. So we find the difference and that gives us the relative mobility score of that particular leg. Now I'm moving on to the results now. Um, so I'm applying this for Port Melbourne, as I said before. Um, the data here is collected um, by using some Python, uh, Python scripts, and it's actually collecting travel time data from uh, here maps. So by using here API. So at, on top of that, in order for us to be able to determine the wait time, we use GTFS data because travel time here, um, travel time from here API, auto give us a breakdown of the journeys, but it doesn't actually tell us specifically how much time we have to wait. So we use the schedule information to estimate that. So we take uh, the travel time data every five minutes and during the study period, um, we focus on the, these three different uh, periods. So morning peak, off peak and evening peak. Um, in order, actually before we focus on Port Melbourne, we've done a preliminary analysis. The idea is that we just would like to try to broaden our search and try to find any other regions that may actually be worse, you know, than Port Melbourne, right? And by the way, we're trying to focus on Port Melbourne because again, our office is there. <clears throat> anyway, um, so now we're actually looking at different uh, five regions at the uh, five different suburbs, right? Here is the Port Melbourne area. Here is the CBD and then three other suburbs. Now, I just would like you to pay attention on how close this Port Melbourne and CBD area actually is, All right? Um, and the score that I'm going to show you next is actually showing you the, um, the average score of throughout the time, uh, the, the time period, of, uh, the study time period, and it's average over all locations. So what I mean by that is that when I'm looking at Port Melbourne, I'm treating that as a, a Port Melbourne as a destination, so then I'm looking at the mobility from the other regions going to Port Melbourne, so as a destination, All right? So here's the, the, the overall results. You can see that CBD is actually best in a sense that it's very easy to, to go to CBD and surprise, surprise, Port Melbourne is actually worst, even though they're actually adjacent suburbs. We actually go, uh, do a bit more uh, analysis here by breaking down the score for different periods. Here we have the morning peak, the off peak, 
and the evening peak, right? So the, there, you notice there are some fluctuations throughout the day, but actually this fluctuation makes sense because when you look at CBD and Port Melbourne, these are pretty much um, like a business um, area, business uh, districts. And therefore you can see that the mobility during the morning peak where people actually go to these businesses is actually higher. Compare that with the other three suburbs, which actually has um, a lot of residential areas, the mobility during the evening peak where people go home is actually a lot higher. So, I mean, this, this just shows that, uh, you know, the, um, this relative mobility measure actually makes sense. And the data here is showing that um, that's how, that's how the, the public transport is set up anyway. So now I'm coming back to these results here by the Port Melbourne. So you've seen the map. But I'm just going to discuss some of our observations from this map. Firstly, as I've mentioned before, right, um, the area mobility, which is the shaded area here, can actually be different compared to the, the mobility of the public transport line. So for instance, I'm coming back here, which is the location of our office. You, because of this, the, the density of the public transport stop is kind of low and the frequency service is low, this actually becomes a bit, um, uh, has a, is categorized as a poor mobility area, right? And whereas the public transport line is actually okay. So now I'm going to look at this particular area here. This actually is a busy activity area. So a lot of shops there. So therefore you can see that the mobility through this area is actually poor both the area wise and the public transport line, simply because if you're driving your car through this, then even though it's a busy activity area, well, you know, if you're driving a car, then you can actually go through this area pretty quickly, but not so much with um, public transport because of the density of the stops and such and such. The final point that I actually would like to point out from this uh, map is that if, if the car journey is actually relatively fast, then it actually reduces the uh, relative mobility score. An example here is actually this line here. Um, this road actually is a main road and this one is actually also a main road. And therefore the, the car travel, the car journey along these lines is actually a lot faster compared to the bus uh, travel along this line. So in a sense that the public transport may not be actually bad, but it's just compared to car is actually not doing great. So now I'm just gonna move on to a little bit of discussions here. I'm trying to circle back to the demand responsive transportation. So um, from this area, um, I guess the one of the more straightforward um, conclusions or implications that perhaps we can try to avoid uh, if, if someone wants to go to the Southern Cross station uh, for commuting, so maybe they can just avoid this act activity areas here. So for instance, if someone's from this region that wants to go to Southern Cross, perhaps there's a, there might be a demand responsive transport that takes them to this green line here, and then they can ride the, um, the bus up there. Or similarly, it can actually go to this way and perhaps go you know, use the demand responsive transport all the way to Southern Cross. Um, well, of course, there are a lot of uh, investigations and optimization that needs to be done there, but those are just some few examples that we may try, right? And therefore we just leave this air, um, public transport lines here for people who actually wants to go to this area. The other, uh, the other thoughts that I would like to, you know, propose here is that we might want to consider demand responsive transport for low demand area, right? There are previous work that's been done by one of my former colleagues at the University of Melbourne. She discovered that um, the critical demand from based on her simulation was that 11 requests per hour per kilometer squared, right? So that means below this number, then it's actually cheaper to operate demand responsive transport, right? Above this number, then it's actually you know, it's it's better to just run conventional bus services. So maybe we can have a look at some of these areas here. So I'm not sure why the, the frequency is low. Um, I haven't actually talked to the transport uh, or, um, authorities here, but I'm guessing because of the low demand. 
right? In the sense that during off peak, nobody travels around this area or very low uh, for very low uh, demand over there. So maybe in that case, we can then switch to demand responsive transport. All right, um, so just a bit of future work. So I've done, in this work, I've looked at how we can try to identify the gaps of the public transport network. Of course, there are a lot of improvements and extensions that can be done onto these works. For instance, actually looking at accessibility rather than just mobility, in the sense that we're looking at also the opportunities that connect uh, to the people rather than just looking at speed might be a, a one way to improve this work, right? But um, eventually though, I, just, I would like to uh, try to look at also how we can um, understand the impact of the mode shift to the art, to demand responsive transport. So how, how, how expensive it is to operate, how would it impact the congestion, would it re reduce it or increase it? And then moving on to also develop any kind of some sort of vehicle routing problem, uh, sorry, vehicle routing algorithms that takes all of this into account and providing optimal trade-off between service level and costs. And finally, we, you know, looking at some sort of integrated journey planner that optimizes the routes for multimodal journeys. Now I'm actually aware that there are a lot of, there are several apps already doing this. Um, but, you know, having said that, I am, um, yeah, I'm keen to investigate further. Anyway, that's uh, that's from me. Thank you very much for listening. All right, super. Thank you, thank you, Ronnie. Um, so there is a question in the in the chat channel um, yep. from earlier on that refer, refers to slide three. So Niraj asked the question: Are you referring to DRT as solving the first long, last mile connectivity? Uh, hang on, let me just. Uh, refer to my slide three again. Do I do I need to share my screen again or not? Uh, that would probably be good for everyone that we can kind of see which which slide we're talking. Okay. We have got a little bit of time for questions, so. Just, uh, yeah. So slide three. So. So that's slide three. So um, um now it's hard to see the question. Huh? So, so I, I can sort of repeat that back. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Are, you, are you referring to DRT as solving the first last mile connectivity? And then, so Niraj follows up by saying, MUS is perhaps a larger picture showing how all services can be integrated for the entire journey. So the key uh, question is, are you referring to DRT? Yeah, okay. Um, so, uh, well, yes, I'm. in this case, I'm referring to demand responsive transport solving first and last mile connectivity and you're right perhaps i'm again i'm <laughs> re um abusing the word the terminology mass here because it, indeed it should be the a larger picture showing how the integration of the services and payment systems but yes i am actually referring to drt as the first and last mile problem okay, thanks thank dr kudadinata it was just that i got mixed up because mass yep. as we all know that it's the entire journey so people might yep. be making several segments of the journey so was not able to connect um, whether mass is only looking at first or my last mile connectivity or it is it the entire journeys yeah well um, so i hope i've conveyed this well enough in my presentation but the, the yep. idea is that i would like to um, my end goal is mass right so an integration of transport services for the people right but um, when I what I mean by in this slide here that the solving the first last mile is the issue that that's uh, the I'm referring to demand responsive transport services so more of a flexible kind of like um, services with flexible routes flexible flexible timetable that can help people to connect to the uh, to the existing public transport lines if that makes sense so yep, I have absolutely. the mass concept in mind but in in, in well, technicality, this um, the, the operation is a is a DRT. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yep, no worries. So um, you have another question, Niraj, I believe, yep. in the chat. Um, well, it was with respect to slide 16. Um, so just wanted to understand, like, um, the statistic which you presented, that 11 requests per hour is the critical uh, demand. Uh, that's very insightful. So just wanted to um, yeah. know your thoughts whether you've seen how it relates with the population density, because um, 
Mm. Fortunately, like uh, I've been to this area, the case study area which you are looking at, and mm. do see that the population is not as dense. So, thus very keen to see what would be the level of effectiveness in such areas if if there has been any investigations made on population density relationship with this number of requests per hour. Um, well, I. Um... To the best of my knowledge, I haven't encountered any study that shows the relationship between population and the uh, uh, number of requests. But a lot of study actually uses um, a lot of simulation study um, uses um, population as a you know as an indicator of a number of requests. You know, so for instance, you, they can adjust the number of randomly generated uh, requests from a certain area. And then they scale it down or up based on the number of populations in that area. Just, um, if, if that makes sense. Um, so, so in short, yep. I'm not sure if there's any proper study that shows the correlation, but a lot of people using the, the population as an indication of the number of requests that may pop up in that area. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. That's great. Does anyone else have any other questions? No burning questions for Ronnie. Ronnie, it looks like you might be off the hook for the presentation. That's very good. So thank you. So just last thank chance, you, last call, last call for for questions. No, I think you I think you good. Thanks, thanks so much. All Ronnie. right, thanks very much, Jonathan. Appreciate it. So we're running well with time, and we're running into uh, our last of the four presentations. And so Shahia is going to be presenting a paper, Reassessing Road Sign Test for Bus Drivers in Dhaka, um, Dhaka City in Bangladesh. Um, and just a little bit of background um, on, on the presenter. Shahia graduated from the Islamic University of Technology, and he has <clears throat> particular interests in uh, traffic safety and modeling. So I might hand over to Shahia now. Shahia, are you there? You able to share hello. your screen? Hello. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. That's super. So <clears throat> happy for you to sort of share your screen and uh, push on with your presentation. Very good. Nearly there. Just Can you see my slides? It's yes, just come through. Perfect. All good to go. Over to you. Okay. Oh, all right. So our presentation is mainly about the reassessing a road sign test of bus drivers in Bangladesh. As in Bangladesh, uh, uh, did it get lost? Yes. Yes. It's just lost the screen share. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's yeah, you're back. You're back. Okay. Okay. So our uh, research is actually about the uh, reassessing road sign test of bus drivers in Bangladesh. Um, in Bangladesh, most of the uh, road traffic accidents are actually causing because of the bus drivers here in Bangladesh. Road traffic accidents have long been known as one of the critical issues, uh, killing nearly 1.3 million people every year and causing tremendous social and economic loss worldwide. The problem is expected to get worse day by day. In developing countries like Bangladesh, crashing accidents is too high. Bangladesh has one of the highest fatality rates of road accidents in the world. In 2017, about 4,000 people were killed in driving deaths in Bangladesh and 2,350 in the first seven months of the year. According to the data compiled by Accident Research Institute in Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology, currently, 600, nearly about 7,000 buses are operating in Dhaka City. Buses and trucks were involved in 2,025 crashes uh, throughout this year. So you can see that almost 40% um, uh, of the uh, crashes were happened through buses or trucks. So here comes our main idea is that why we chose bus drivers rather than other drivers? Because we found out that most of the bus drivers here in Bangladesh are not uh, aware of the road signs, uh, though uh, that they should have been known. So that's why we actually chose bus drivers in Dhaka City, Bangladesh. 
So our main uh, outline is uh, here. You can see that background and uh, objective of the study. I already mentioned about the core objective of our study, why we are actually uh, doing this study and all. And so throughout this process, I'll take you all through this journey. So as you can see that road safety concern in Bangladesh is really a big concern here in Bangladesh. Dhaka Metropolitan Police filed 400 uh, 4,617 cases over traffic violations. The main problem here is nobody cares about the road signs. Nobody uh, doesn't give uh, proper uh, valuation to the road safety. As you can see in the picture, the jaywalking is, uh, should be uh, there for the people who are actually crossing the roads. But uh, some of the drivers are actually taking their vehicles on the zebra crossing. So this is uh, jaywalking. So this is uh, the main problem here in Bangladesh. And also you can see there is a no parking sign on the road, but people are actually um, placing their cars and parking their cars over there. So these are the some uh, examples. What are actually, uh, what are the main causes? Uh, what are the main reasons why we are actually doing this study? So little bit of background that uh, throughout this uh, process, we actually found many uh, papers or uh, researches are actually uh, concerning the reassessing uh, the roads, uh, reassessing the driving license for the brass drivers. Mm, many uh, uh, researchers uh, strongly suggested that uh, strong regional guidance are needed for, uh, and license of inactive drivers should be assessed throughout uh, after some years of their uh, driving experience. Driving training lessons must be implemented and older drivers represent no greater road risk. So some of the uh, actually uh, papers indicated that uh, older drivers uh, uh, actually uh, shows a greater risk, but th uh, that might not be the case for some cases. Drivers in coaching condition improved their situation. Uh, as you can see that uh, most of the drivers who were actually uh, trained after their uh, couple of uh, years of their uh, driving experience, they were better in terms of other drivers. And new license renewals should be assessed more frequently. So uh, throughout the, our uh, research, we actually uh, focus more on uh, reassessing the driving license because um, we found out that most of the drivers can't recall road sign uh, after a couple of years of their road sign. So our objective of the study is to identify the drivers who scored poorly throughout the road sign test. So now we actually did a questionnaire survey and uh, throughout the survey, we actually asked them to recall some of the road signs and most of us and we actually scored them based upon uh, the recognition of those road signs. So this is how we actually scored them uh, um, through road sign test to find out uh, whether the drivers are properly trained or not. And these are uh, these are one of our main objective to uh, find out those group of drivers who are actually uh, causing problems to the roads. And uh, they are the main reason behind these uh, road crashes. Whether drivers are following the traffic rules and uh, regulations uh, while driving, and whether driver can recall the traffic rules and regulations after getting the license. And uh, the significance of the, our research is to uh, provide a safer road for everyone, for the drivers and uh, the poor distance board. And uh, researches on read uh, road scientists has not been done yet in constant, uh, context of Bangladesh. So where we found out that uh, in developing countries, the road scientist has not been, uh, there, uh, the limit number of researches on renewal of driving license and road scientists are very minimal. So uh, this is why we are actually targeting uh, this uh, research and, and our main objective is to uh, bring uh, on uh, upon these uh, main issues we are facing here in, our, in the developing countries, uh, the road scientists. So moving on to the research, uh, literature review. Uh, so revolution of driver uh, driving license is the main uh, issue here uh, because uh, driving license should uh, be assessed and previous studies also uh, give importance on this particular topic as uh, re-evaluating driving license uh, may be helpful for the uh, drivers and pedestrians as well. And, um, Driving license, uh, re, uh, license renewal process should be there 
to uh, reduce fatalities among LRD drivers. And one of the main uh, factors there is driving experience has an important effect on the driving. So from our model, we also found that the driving age, uh, driver's age and driver's experience has an important effect on the road safety and driving performance. Driving attitude and characteristics. The driver's attitude and characteristics has an impact on the road sign as some of the drivers who are actually uh, driving more uh, roughly are uh, causing more uh, trouble to the roads and uh, rather than the uh, drivers who are actually uh, more cautious. Effects of experience and education has also uh, go, uh, impact on the road safety and fitness of the driver is one of the main uh, factors behind this road safety. So our model uh, through, uh, this is the process how we made our model. So we actually prepared a questionnaire survey, then we collected the data and we developed a statistical model. And then uh, from the model development, we found out the factors which are actually affecting the driving performance and development of forecasting equation. Throughout the uh, forecasting equation, we found out the factors which are affecting the driving performance and uh, how they can be uh, assessed. Main steps for our methodology are the questionnaire survey preparation, developing a linear regression model from the questionnaire survey data and explanation of model results. So while uh, making our questionnaire survey, we actually considered the local context by our own judgment. And we also followed the previous uh, researches on road science, uh, the limited amount of research we had in our hand. And from those contexts, we actually uh, made up our questions and uh, questionnaire survey. And we also modified the survey based upon the respondents interview. So this is our uh, questionnaire survey. And as you can see on the right side that these are the road signs we actually asked the bus drivers to recall and uh, they were scored upon, you can see in the 33 number, uh, there is a score uh, option available there. So based upon this uh, road sign test, they were scored upon that and um, the and we found out how these are the, um, the questions you can see age, education level, and different uh, socioeconomic factors are affecting that score. So these are our main targets. So we actually collected uh, 296 data throughout this uh, process and uh, here we go. So our study locations actually uh, worked on Gaptoli bus terminal, Abdullapur bus stop and Jimpur bus stop. These are the main uh, hubs of bus drivers in Dhaka city. So we actually carried out our uh, questionnaire survey in these locations. Our questions actually uh, made up on based on their socioeconomic factors, licensing and driving experience and road scientists. We uh, asked them about mandatory science, cautionary science and informative science. Our statistical model was developed uh, through linear regression model as in our study, most of the dependent variables are continuous and for this reason, we actually uh, developed a linear regression uh, analysis. Though these are simple linear regression model uh, from which we actually got our model result. So here you can see that um, we actually put different uh, uh, variables which are actually affecting the driving condition. And from the model result, we uh, actually got the B1, B2 and uh, values that if the result is plus, then they are getting more, better marks. And if the result is lower, then they are getting negative marks. So this is how we actually carried out our model and got the result. So based on our data analysis in Stata, we got 20, uh, 12 significant variables from 296 observations. Uh, in the next slide, you can see that 15 to 30, actually these are the uh, short names for error levels. So you can see that 
uh, 15 to 40 drivers aging between uh, 15 to 30, they actually scored less than the other drivers. So, and uh, on the other hand, you can see that signal help. No, the drivers who think that signal doesn't help, they scored less than the other drivers. So this is how we actually developed our model and uh, found out how different uh, factors are affecting their performance. So this is our forecasting equation. From that, uh, the, uh, the slide I showed in this slide, we actually found out the different variables. Those are actually affecting driving performance. And from that, we actually found out our forecasting equation from where we can easily, uh, if we can put the variables here and we can uh, get the result from there. So if the uh, beta value is positive, in that case, the drivers are actually scoring high. And if the beta value is decreasing, in that case, the drivers are scoring low. So these are results to what we got actually. As I mentioned earlier, the drivers aging for 46 to 60, those group of drivers actually scored less compared to the other drivers. And uh, these are uh, in the left side, you can see these are the factors we are, which are actually affecting the driver's performance. And on the right side, you can see that drivers aging from 15 to 30, those are the uh, drivers who are actually um, doing better in their driving performance. As we can say that the drivers uh, in, in between 15 to 30, they are much younger and they just got their license. And that's why they know how, this, uh, how to recall the road signs. So this is the reason why they are um, are doing better in their road side. And also, you can see that there is a, another factor, which is income. So why drivers with income uh, better than other drivers are actually doing good? Because the drivers who are have a, a good income rather than other drivers are more uh, relaxed and they do not have to worry about their income anymore. So that's why they uh, uh, ride slowly and they are... Um, more relaxed. That's why their score value is higher. On the other hand, the drivers who actually are uh, less income, they are they think of uh, doing more trips so that they can get more money. In that way, they are causing trouble to, to the uh, roads and they are not uh, recall, uh, not following the road signs. So the practical implication of our study will actually help the uh, our government to find out those group of drivers who has less knowledge about road signs and those who can actually um, be identified those uh, through this test and uh, they can uh, find out the which group of drivers should be uh, reassessed and which group of drivers should be given uh, the next driving license. So these are the references we have. So that's from me, thank you. Super, thank you. Do we have any questions? We've got plenty of time for questions. Any questions? While people are thinking about questions, can you just sort of unpack the age component a little bit? Um, so the youngest you can hold a license is 15? Uh, yeah. Okay. So so what, what's sort of playing out in that middle age group? So it was from uh, 40 to 40 something to 60 in your results. What 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 do you sort of what what how do you rationalize the processes that are going on in that age group? Uh, uh, sorry, could you please repeat the question? Um, the, if you went back to one of the last slides that you had, you presented the results, um, the one with the positives and negatives, it's slide 26. Uh, this yeah. one, yeah. Yeah, so what's going on? How, how do you rationalize the age, the drivers that are aged between 45 and 60 with a decreased score? What, what's playing out there? Okay, so we actually asked the drivers why they are actually uh, doing more trips. So we found out that uh, the drivers uh, in between 46 to uh, 60 years, they cannot recall the road signs we actually uh, carried out in the slide. As you can see here, we asked them whether they can recall these road sign tests. And most of them uh, were not able to recall the road signs. Whereas the drivers from 16 to 30 uh, years of age, they actually uh, correct, uh, got more answers than the elder ones. So from our model result, we found out that the drivers who can actually recall the road signs 
are better uh, performer than the drivers who cannot. And what about plus age 60 plus? Do, were they in the sample as well? Uh, we actually didn't find any drivers uh, more than 60 years old. So I don't have that answer for you. No, Sorry. That's okay. No, it's just, it's just a really interesting relationship. You've kind of got this, this kind of cautious, um, newly, newly kind of minted drivers. And then you've got this kind of less um uh sort of more jaded drivers that pay less attention and i just wondered whether or not people become more cautious again as they get older it's a sort of a dovetailing relationship yeah yeah so actually this is the relationship between the road scientist and uh, their performance so we actually you know found out that how their uh, different factors like age education are actually affecting their scores on this road scientist sure no that's good that's good stuff um, does anyone else have any questions? Yes, Ronnie. Uh, yes. Hello, Shaya, and thanks for the interesting presentation. Um, I, I do have a question, though, because um, I was originally born in Indonesia, and I, I live, uh, I spent my childhood in Jakarta, uh, and obviously the, um, you know, well, sorry, not obviously, but a lot of people there pretty much just ignores the road rules really completely. Um, yeah. They just drive according to their, you know, this, there's a street rule that, ha that you have to follow, that you have to learn, you know, pretty much pass on the knowledge from your dad to, to myself and then I have to pass it on to your children, you know. So just wondering though, um, with, this, um, with this approach here, with the uh, retraining, how, do, you, do you already, is there any evidence that shows that, um, they will start to follow if nobody else is in the um, you know on the road actually follows that rule properly if, if that makes sense uh yeah uh, so uh, your question is about that uh, whether this training will actually help or not uh yes in short yes so okay so uh, that training will actually help because uh, most of them actually do not know the road signs and when we carried out our uh, questionnaire survey uh, most of them were like, I know this, but I cannot recall it. So, you know, the problem, they, they are actually well, uh, not aware of the road signs anymore. So if they are trained properly, then they can recall, oh, this one is uh, the road sign I uh, just remembered. So it's more like our study process. Like we uh, read every day because we uh, need to learn and we need to recall uh, if we do not study for one month on a particular subject, we actually forget. This is a particular human nature. So if we uh, train them on a regular basis, like uh, once, uh, once in every year for the younger people, whereas three times uh, in a year for the older people, because, because they cannot uh, recall, and they are not being able to recall that much uh, than the younger people. So this model will actually help the government officials or the policy makers to actually find out those drivers who need the uh, training right away or who need the training year after one year or two years after that. So did my explanation got your answer? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Good, does anyone else have any other questions? Maybe not. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. And look, that brings us to the end of our four presenters. Um, so I'd just like to thank all of the presenters for, for their papers and also for, for the audience for your questions and, and listening throughout. Um, and so that concludes, I think, track um, 3E, I believe um, our track was called. And so I hope that you uh, enjoy the rest of um, the conference and, and hopefully meet you at some person in, in person um, rather than in this, this, this online environment. But if not, I think we'll bring um, this session to a close and thanks to Dia for, for chairing and moderating the first session and uh, we'll see you in the rest of the conference. Okay, enjoy, uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon and have a wonderful weekend. Bye all.